Hi, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. My name is Gerald Lawrence. I'm the chairman of the County Board of Elections and we'll call to order the uh, November 9th, 2021 meeting of the Board of Elections. First order of business is the Pledge of Allegiance. We'll stand and say the pledge. Pledge of Allegiance, pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, So the, uh, the agenda was, uh, was published yesterday. It's been distributed to the board members. Does anybody have any comments on the... Uh... You, you know what? I just, I realized this microphone is only for the broadcast. There's no microphone within this room. There's, there's no amplification. I tapped on it before and I said, oh, I don't hear it. And then it occurred to me it's only for the broadcast. So um, I will uh, try to project my voice as best I can with the mask. Um, the uh, the agenda. Anyone have any uh, additions or changes to the agenda? No. Yeah. Okay. So we'll uh, we'll proceed. Next is the uh, uh, typically the approval of minutes. We have no minutes to review today. Uh, item five is going to be Mr. Mr. Allen's report. When you're ready, Jim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and members of the board. Uh, overall, we had a, a very a successful election despite some challenges, um, at least on our end. Uh, we had a two-ballot election for the first time. Uh, voters understood it. We constructed it in such a way so that the delivery of the ballots to the precincts came collated. So there, there wasn't this problem that you typically have with an election where the poll workers are only handing out ballot A. So we, we had that, we had a system in place for spoiled ballots and, and uh, everything else. Uh, pick up and drop off went smoothly. Uh, we had more testing of our ballots than ever before so that uh, the readability of the election day ballots was virtually guaranteed. We were at the print shop uh, testing them. We, we tested them through pre-election logic and accuracy testing uh, we also did test decks, uh, and uh, so the, the, the combination of tests exceeds anything that any other jurisdiction in the Commonwealth performs, and that worked out on Election Day. So the warehouses work, uh, the bureaus work on the testing and everything else, that worked out. What we learned that we will have to test in the future and this has never been a problem before, is the same printing vendor, vendor who performed well on the, the printing of the ballots did not do so well <laughs> on, one of the, on two of the batches of the mailings, and one of them was misaddressed to 708 voters. Fortunately, it was one of the smaller files. However, it created a lot of uh, difficulties for our staff uh, for our voters, more importantly, and ultimately is spilled over a little bit into Election Day. Uh, but overall, Election Day calls from our poll workers were fewer than we've ever had before. Uh, the, the complaints were not having to do with the election administration, but with typically with disturbances or disagreements at the polling place. And uh, but we did have to contend with in the days leading up to Election Day, uh, issues with replacement ballots uh, for the people who were affected by the 708 uh, that, were, that were part of file four that were handled by the vendor, as well as 65 voters who our staff inserted the wrong envelope. Different issue entirely, but nonetheless related. So, uh, I want to congratulate our warehouse who was shorthanded throughout this whole process and still beat and exceeded every deadline and still made sure that every election supply carrier or cage was properly equipped. Jim Savage's team really uh, turned it up a notch this election, even when the printing vendor, for example, was later than expected with the ballot delivery. Uh, same for voter registration. Um, we were thinking that 
We, with 1,400 provisional ballots, it was going to take until Friday and would be close call. They pretty much finished up all their work today. So, and that's with, uh, in, in spite of some objections, which they didn't have in the primary, uh, they're even, even having time to go back and the objectors were, as I understand it, unobjecting or withdrawing their objections to several items. Um, and lastly, the Bureau of Elections uh, did a really good job and we're gonna about to go through some of the reports on the exceptions and uh, I'm gonna be asking your recommendations on a few items. So with that, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Um, I don't have any questions in particular. I, I will say I think that uh, uh, things did go uh, remarkably well. This is our uh, uh, third cycle using the equipment in this fashion. We did use it for the, the one cycle that we did the, the central tabulation, and uh, things have continued to get smoother. I know uh, uh, it just seemed anecdotally there was uh, fewer complaints from poll workers about equipment and malfunctions and, and, and so forth. And the election day itself uh, went rather smoothly. Um, you know, obviously there's uh, concern about the, the vendor and the mail ballots and so forth. And I know we're, we're looking into that and we'll, we'll address that uh, uh, as we move forward. Um, but uh, on the whole, I think people were, were generally very pleased with, uh, with how this election ran still in a pandemic, still with masks and other things, which is better at doing it now. And in particular, and, and I don't think it can be said enough, you, you mentioned it, that staffing was a really, really significant difficulty across all aspects of our operation. You know, as many of you know, just from in your communities, when you see businesses and restaurants and so forth that have difficulty getting staff, we had uh, the same very, very difficult challenges and did a lot of things uh, shorthanded, which caused the people we had to work extra hard. And uh, we uh, are very much appreciated the people that we have and the efforts that they made uh, to make the selection go uh, as smoothly as it did. So I don't have any other general comments other than that. And, and one acknowledgement or admission, however you want to put it, to the staffing, the end end, uh, staffing. Uh, for example, we have two lock bo drop boxes that are indoor locations. One is in Chad's Ford and one is in Radnor. I'm sorry, not Radnor, uh, Ridley. And uh, so the normal follow-up would be that that would happen on Wednesday. A little louder. The, the normal follow-up would be on Wednesday and through, because people were shorthanded, they did not go back to the, those two, which are in, in closed locations until uh, this pet, just yesterday and cleared out those boxes. So those ballots are being processed. So we regret any uh, inconveniences caused any voter who looked up their status over the last five days and thought, I know I used that drop box before election day. Um, and so th those are being processed. In both cases, there was about two dozen ballots that were dropped at each location. So. Uh, little things like that, uh, staffing issues were, uh, it, was, it was challenging. Or we'd have temporary workers one day and then they, they decided they didn't want to work at the warehouse or at the bureau the next day and we're back to the, the starting point and trying to train somebody new. So, thank you. Anybody else comment? No, I agree with what you said. Okay. All right, so why don't we start with, uh, with the items for consideration. So the first item has to do with uh, the file for vote by mail envelopes I just referenced where the vendor had the fourth and one of the smaller vote by mail files where they misaddressed the exterior envelope. So Sam Smith was getting Janet Jones's materials and on the envelope, it had Janet Smith, out exterior envelope, it had Janet Jones's name, then it had Sam Smith's address. Inside was everything from Janet Jones for the ballot and the return envelope. This created a, a couple of concerns. Obviously, the possibility of, of someone abusing that situation and then remailing it, uh, the possibility of getting two from one voter. We also had it complicated in a good way 
because we had a number of voters that I call Good Samaritans who realized that they got, they received somebody else's materials and actually took it to that other voter. So we couldn't cancel them because then we would, we would cancel and divert the envelope that was rightly voted by the, the right voter. Uh, and at the same time, we had to guard against double voting. So those were remailed. And fortunately, the vast majority of the ballots that we received back on those were to the addressee. Uh, and Initially, based on the calls that we were receiving and the images that people were either sending us or, or walking them into our offices. So sometimes these were uh, snapshots of envelopes and we could see exactly what was misaddressed. So when we got the complaints, we were able to see that all the complaints were coming from, as you're calling it, file four. Correct. Which were mailed by the vendor ostensibly on October the 25th. Correct. And so for those 708, and that was the total universe of everybody that was in that, that, that file or that batch. Yes. We mailed, we, we remailed to them ballots and they were specially marked somehow? Yes. The, the return envelopes were marked with the word remailed in red. Okay. And so this list that, we, we, that, that you've just given us represents what? This represents 400 and the first 412 items represents how we went through and we determined that either they, they received the Good Samaritan envelope mailing uh, because we examined the, the signature or they received the remail envelope and that the signature was a match on the voter's name and address on that that return envelope containing the ballot. Okay. And now let me go back, I guess, before I get to the list. When we when we sent the, the 708 remails out, um, was there any other communication with it telling the voter, hey, there was a problem? You're, 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 what did we tell them to do with the first ballot? And we, you know, we told them to mail, you know, fill out the second ballot and mail it in or drop it off or get there, it back to us somehow. There was uh, an additional letter with that remailing that explained what had happened and that if they should receive somehow the first ballot, they should discard that and uh, mail in the second ballot only. So, so let's say they had already, you know, perhaps an error, you know, um, mm -hmm. received that first ballot, you know, even though it didn't have their name on it, they signed it and sent it back in. Mm -hmm. How did we identify that that ballot should not count? Well, the, we, we have some examples in the, the later ones where that exact, that, that in, in fact did happen. So um, some we treated as what I call innocent victims, where we looked up their registration and signature and we were able to determine this was another voter in the 708 file. So if you look at, uh, Item 419, for example, voter Thomas received and returned voter Hall's ballot. Okay. So we looked up Thomas's registration. We also watched for any other envelope from Thomas. We did not receive one. But let me ask, let me start. Oh, go, go ahead. How, how do we do that? I mean, because we, we receive 36,000 right. mail-in ballots. 
I mean, I, I, do we rely on humans to do that, or is that the Blue Crest machine, or is there some other scan that goes on that would have identified the first set of ballots that were sent out? After they go through the Blue Crest, when they're coming in through the mail, starting October 16, okay. they're sorted down to the precinct level. So when we had this 708 file, we assigned crews every day, after, starting with the 25th, 26th, when we realized what the problem was, to go through all of those precincts and look for any of these 708 that were, were returned. But in each precinct, you only had to look for two or three items or fewer. Uh, some had none, some had six. So it, it was typically a low number with 428 precincts. So we sorted that list first by precinct and then alphabetically, and then every day with every new arrival of mail and Dropbox ballots, staff would go through and remove any of the, what we call file four or 708s because there were quantity 708. I, I and, and again, I, 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 I credit you and the, and the staff. I know you, you know, really uh, tried the card, but I, I also struggle with if, if it was addressed to John Smith, you know, and Mark Jones got it. Right. You know, it, and the, the third party vendor or the computers couldn't tell us, you know, that Mark Jones got John Smith's ballot. You know, how that, that was identified, which. Which was the problem, the one that was mailed to or the one that was inside? So We knew the entire universe, though, of 708. Mark Jones was part of the 708, and so was the other name you just mentioned that I'm right, failing yeah. to rem remember. Okay. So, you, so you essentially you went, you pulled the, all, the whole 708 that was potentially a problem, manually going through, pulling them aside. You had machinery help sort some things, but ultimately... Our, each precinct. Our, our uh, staff had to go through. They knew which precincts to look in. They knew the names. And if those ballots came back, they pulled them, right. set them aside. And that total of 429 of the 708 came back, according to this list. Yeah, there, there are a couple others that are just, they're not included here because they're, we can't count them because of other issues. They're not signed. They're not dated. Okay. So we, we did get a total of you know, 430 odd back, but you know, those are treated the same way that any other unsigned uh, or undated, unsigned or or undated envelope comes. They, they can't be counted. Okay. And then of the, the 429 that are potential to be counted because they were otherwise proper, 412 of them, you've made the determination that they were sent to the right person, returned by the right person, signed and voted by the right person. Is that, is that what you said before, or did I not understand it? Let's see John yes. shaking his head. The, I feel the, like that's what you said. The first 412 on this list. Were, were sent to the right person? Sent to or received by the voter listed on that envelope and signed by that voter. The signature is a match. So the, fir so the first 412 that you're recommending to count Oh. They, they, they didn't have a problem of the 708. Yes, they did. Some of them, some of them did. They either were remailed or we were able to determine from the signature which other voter from the 708 this was. So the first 412, that could either be that they returned their first ballot and we looked at it and we said, it's okay, or they returned the remailed ballot and we checked to make sure that the first ballot was not returned to us. Yes. And that the voter did not vote on election day. Yes. And that the voter did not cast a provisional ballot. Yes. Okay. And just to be clear so everybody understands, if they made an application and were sent a ballot, they're not in the book, so they couldn't have voted on election day. And then the provisional ballot issue is the same as any other provisional ballot. We see if they voted. They, they, yeah, they shouldn't have voted. They, they shouldn't have voted on election, 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 election day, but they election. still could have allowed. Uh, could have been allowed, and so we checked. We had uh, the voter registration staff check the poll books for the affected precincts to see if any of those voters were uh, voted in person. Um, so, the, my other question would be: 
voters 430 through 708. Where are they? They either voted in person. But they, but we, uh, they shouldn't have been able to vote in person. Well, they can't. The, 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 well, if they surrendered yeah. a if they ballot, surrendered. if they surrendered their ballot. A ballot in an envelope, they could have voted in person. They didn't vote at all, or in a, a handful of cases, they voted a provisional ballot. And you said there were some defects too. What's that? There were others that were encountered. I thought you said because of, they didn't sign it or something else. There were other. Correct. Defects. Yeah. Do we know the exact number of those? I mean, I don't want to, if you don't have the exact number, of, but it's a small number. It's a, we could say it's, it's less than a dozen. Yes. A, a relatively small number of defects. Un undated or unsigned. Which, or know, both. anybody who's done this before knows we get a lot of back that are undated, unsigned, and they don't count because the law is we can't count them. So that's why they're not on this list. So we're through the 412, I think he hasn't. I think we understand what the yeah. 412 is. I just wanted yeah. to make sure we're all clear on that before you go on, because if that wasn't complicated enough, now it gets complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Item 413, and uh, th this is voter Doherty received in error voter Jefferson's ballot on the first mailing can't know what the thinking was of voter Doherty but then uh, perhaps when receiving the second uh, envelope realized that uh, that was the one they should cast so we we rejected the one Mark Jefferson but signed by Doherty All right, so to get this straight, so on line 413 on Doherty, we, we got two ballots back. One was Jefferson's ballot, which Doherty had voted and signed her name to, maybe not realizing, whatever. We rejected that. We also got Doherty's remailed ballot back, which she voted properly. Mm -hmm. So the recommendation is to reject the Jefferson ballot voted by Doherty, but count the remailed ballot that Doherty got as, as the remedy. As, as her as her vote correct okay so is Francis already listed above in the 412 somewhere so item 413 we'd be rejecting the ballot cast by Doherty for Jefferson that, I understand my question, so therefore, if you're saying well, that... Do Doherty would be... Or did Doherty not cast another ballot in her name and only cast a ballot in Jefferson's name? Yeah, I guess that's what I don't understand. I, I sort of understood that she mistakenly cast two ballots. I'd have to check to see if, if um, Jefferson received and voted her replacement ballot. This is sorted by... Right, but this is 413 is telling us, it sounds like this is that voter Doherty received... In, on the initial mailing. Right. On the outside, it was voter Doherty at her address. And on the inside, it was voter Jefferson's ballot. Mm -hmm. Voter Doherty, for whatever reason, mistakenly or not, signed or voted Jefferson's ballot, signed it, and returned it to us. And, and we're rejecting that now as, as improperly cast. We're accepting the one that's in her name. We're rejecting the one that she signed on Doherty's name, uh, with the envelope with Doherty's name. Okay, so I'm back to, I guess, the question of, does that mean that Doherty's I'm sorry, with Jefferson, I'm sorry, we're, Jefferson. we're rejecting the Jefferson envelope that Doherty signed because we have a Doherty envelope that Doherty signed. Okay, so 
Doherty must is is in the first four hundred and twelve? No. 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 I happen. thought your question was related to Jefferson at first, so I'm you're, looking you're for that. You're telling us that voter Dougherty cast two ballots. Returned two envelopes. Returned right. two envelopes. One for, one for voter Dougherty herself, one mistakenly with voter Jefferson's ballot. Right. So item 413, you're asking us to reject the one that Dougherty... I'm asking you to approve the one where Doherty signed properly signed her uh, the, the request of the recommendation is to count the doherty signed the doherty envelope yeah, the okay the correct so what happened to voter jefferson i'd have to check in here if she received her replacement envelope and voted it or voted in person on election day Scanning through here, these are not uh, alphabetical. Alphabet right. alphabetical. Another Doherty at 111, it's, but it's yeah, a different Doherty. Sorry, we'll do our best. Um, the uh, we don't see anything about the Jefferson ballot here because it was rejected. These are only ballots that we're we're looking to count, but we're going to look into what the status is with Jefferson, whether Jefferson voted either provisionally or in person or, or by some other manner. But Jefferson, at least as best we can tell from looking at this, we don't see Jefferson's name on here. We're going to check electronically and, and see what's going on there. You want to go to the next one? Sure. The, the next one is a similar situation where uh, we're recommending that we count the envelope where voter rounds signed voter rounds's um, envelope. So, <coughs> yeah, we before we vote, yet. before we vote, we'll take. Um. Yeah, I actually like just trying for us to get a sense of what we're doing here rather than get it going in 12 directions with public comment, but we will take public comment before we do any action, okay? Okay. Uh, the next Catan, the next one. Uh, there's no secrecy envelope. You can see right through the envelope that there's, a, a, there's only a ballot inside. It's also thinner than the other ballot submissions, so we're, we're recommending no count on that. Okay. Richard Missioner, we're recommend, recommending no count, undated envelope. Voter Saqib, item 417. The signature is clearly not a match. We checked also the application for the uh, by mail ballot, and it's not a match for that either. It's nowhere close. And part of the court agreement was that we needed to do signature verification on each of these. Okay. This next one, we're not really asking for a, a, a ruling on this. We had two voters, Betty Ann Wilson and Betty A. Wilson. We suspect uh, daughter and, and mother. And Betty A. Wilson would be the daughter in this case. They both live at the same address. I wanted to include this. This was wrongly pulled and set aside because staff was so diligent, they saw Betty Wilson. They pulled this one out and only Betty Ann Wilson's was affected by the 708. So since we have this segregated now, because staff was so diligent about doing their job, I just wanted to make sure 
we're making it part of the record that we're counting this one because that was never part of this file. Oh, okay. Is, is that a recommendation or has it already been accomplished? It has not been accomplished okay. yet because we sequestered anything. Okay. In other words, you pulled it, you put it in this group. <coughs> it wasn't counted in a normal course, so we're going to vote today whether or not to count it. But as a technical matter, it was pulled as a precaution. It's not really part of the group. Yeah, that's how okay. it's it's just an example of how diligent staff was about pulling out anything that looked like a voter from that precinct with that name. Okay. The next one is uh, voter Thomas. This is again. Um, he he re voted. He's an innocent uh, victim, if you will, received and returned voter Hall's ballot. So. We, we would credit that the, the votes and the ballot on that one to uh, voter Thomas. The recommendation is to count that one. All right, so now, now we're getting into something different than what we had before, and I would imagine that there's gonna be some questions about it. Okay. And there's a couple more coming up that are the same as this. So this is voter Thomas got a ballot with voter Hall's name on it and voted the ballot, signed his name, didn't try to Hall or anything else, just, you know, probably didn't even look at the name, came to his house, he signed his name, returned the ballot. And the recommendation is we count that ballot. Yes. That one I have some concerns with. How can we count a ballot prepared for Hall but voted by Thomas? This is what we discussed in open court, uh, that there would be the, the questions about the, the Good Samaritan, and was that entirely the normal chain of custody for someone to take someone else, uh, their, their ballot? And there would be questions about someone who looks at the envelope, doesn't even notice that it's got another name on it, but as part of this 708 file, we check the signature, we check to find out, A, is this voter part of the 708 file? Is it conceivable that this voter received um, you know, the, we're, we're talking about Thomas right now, received yeah. the Hall ballot? And it is. And then you look at the signature, and we match it on the Roger James Thomas uh, voter registration signature, and it's a, it's a clear 100% match. And, and the ballot that Thomas was entitled to get was identical to the ballot that Hall was entitled to get? In other words, the offices were the same? Same precinct? W when it's not, we have to, re if it's not the same precinct, we have to, to um, In this instance, it was the same precinct. I don't know off the top of my head. I didn't make that detailed of a notation, but there is a note on the, we can tell from the envelope which precinct ballot they received and we're able to open it, see if that precinct and ballot is in there. And if it's the wrong precinct for that voter, for voter Thomas, then we have to, uh, to transcribe only the votes for the offices that voter Thomas was entitled to vote. So if he were in the wrong precinct, he wasn't entitled to vote, for, for example, for the judge or the inspector in that precinct. Well, that, that's what we have down lower on the list at like 428, 429. Those are partial counts. Those are where the, the ballot isn't identical. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. But you also validated that Thomas hadn't voted elsewhere, right, as part of the steps that you've described previously. Yes. Okay. And then for Thomas's 419 down to... Uh, Uh, Jones is uh, 425. Those six are the same issue, right? The, exactly. That the, the voter A got voter B's ballot, voter A signed and voted that ballot, returned it. They were the same precinct, so that would be the same as if they had returned their own ballot, but for the fact it was originally addressed to someone else within their precinct. So that's those, those six. Okay, what are the next two? Now this one we just made reference to above. 
See, we have rounce is also item 414. And rounce initially uh, or, or ultimately received and voted her own envelope and ballot. Here we have uh, the initial response by rounce, which was to sign Elaine her own name to okay. the envelope that was intended for voter Billingsley rather than get into uh, whether or not that's the right precinct or anything else, we would, re we would only count the one that, the, the rounds signature on the rounds envelope. Okay, so. The email. So the email. 426, rounds returned the wrong ballot, but later on in time, rounds actually got a remail ballot and voted the remail ballot. So in this instance, rounds voted, voted the proper ballot with the remail ballot, no reason to count this ballot. The recommendation is no count on 426. Correct. Okay. Any questions on that one? No. All right. 427. Uh, this also is a repeat. Same issue as, as rounds. Got, got a remail ballot. Don't want to vote the original ballot. Huh. The, what, actually, th yeah, this, is, this is this is actually the, the same item as above. Four, 428 we're on now, right? Four, 427. 427. 427. Billingsley. So this is the envelope that we're no, not counting. No, this is Billingsley. I see. This is, if you look at the previous item. It's right. the one that Rounch voted for her. Right. So we're... We're it's not listed twice in error. I apologize. Okay. And then 428. Square is, is one where uh, voted um, Plotnik original envelope. We were able to verify Square's signature, but it's in a different jurisdiction, so that would be a partial recount. A partial count, rather. Not a partial recount. Likewise, the last item, voter John, would be a partial count, entirely different precinct than voted the Fitzgerald envelope. Okay. All right, I think we have the lay of the land now. Um, before we move, uh, Part of me says we could have one motion to do them all, but I think people may have different uh, opinions and different views on the envelopes in the different categories. So I think it might be prudent to do them as separate votes by, by category. Do you guys uh, agree with that? Yes. Okay. Um, so let's let's start with the 412. That are the the remails where we only received the the remail and we verified that it was the. Uh, the proper voter. Can we have a motion uh, on those? Oh, we gonna take public comment. We will. Yeah, we, we will. We'll get a first. motion, then yeah, we'll no. discuss, then we'll have public comment. Okay? okay. I'm not voting yet. I'm just getting a motion right. on the so, table to so procedurally move. The it move forward. is to count the 412, first 412 on the list. I so moved. I'll second. All right. So we've moved and seconded that. So um, do we want to do us? Do you want to hear the public comment first? I want to hear the public comment first. I can see there's. Uh, a lot of talented attorneys out here are probably going to make compelling arguments that will influence our thoughts. So, uh, who wants to go first? You guys are looking at each other. <laughs> no, <not laughs> no? <this. laughs> you don't have to. You don't have to go first, but I. Well, yeah, George and I basically finished that. Mr. Chairman, uh, board members Lunkenheimer and McBlain. Uh, Mr. Allen and Solicitor Parks, thank you. Somebody maybe help Mr. Pupio with the yeah, microphone. Well, they'll yeah. need help after I'm done because they'll need to raise it. <laughs> there we so go. Uh, thank you, and thank you for the clarification. Um, just, uh, just some questions that I think that were brought that are some uh, issues that the board may wish to consider prior to moving on. Uh, one of the questions I think that Mr. McBlain had addressed to the board was, um, if the vendor's technology was incorrect in moving forward with these 708, 
Um, how, once a ballot is opened for one of the ones that you are going to consider in the next series of motions, is the, is the board going to require that that ballot actually be, you know, fully reviewed to determine whether or not it is uh, somebody from uh, Springfield 1-1? So, you know, did they vote a Springfield 1-1 ballot if that's where they live? I know Mr. Allen had indicated that it was going to be a partial count, but how does that how does that happen? So, if does the, is the person writing because when you get down to the bottom of some of these judges of elections and things like that, you know they're very different and ward wise. So that would be a question along those lines. Another question that I would respectfully submit that I think is out there uh, and existing is uh, Mr. Allen indicated that the, um, that the 708 were identified um, based upon complaints that were, that were received uh, by the board. Um, you know, was that verified by the vendor? Was there ever any understanding of what the, what the software issue was? For example, was it every fourth envelope? Was it, was it for you gentle, uh, for, for uh, you gentlemen and uh, the gentle lady here, if there were four here, if it were Mr. Allen, Mr. McLean, Mr. Lawrence, and Ms. Lunkenheimer, was there ever any rhyme nor reason understanding that it's simply that they just messed up one and started with Mr. McBlain's address and your number and somewhere down the line. Um, just some of those questions. Um, one of the questions I, that- I don't, I don't want to cut you off, but why don't yep. we answer one or two of the questions before oh, we I, have 25 questions. Yeah, I was just going to lay them out. I wasn't sure if that was your procedure as to whether you wanted to respond or not. That's up to you, Mr. Chairman. Thank I, you, I just think it might work, be more uh, efficient and clearer Absolutely, if we do. Yes, sir. Um, so, uh, Mr. Allen, we, we didn't get 708 complaints, right? We didn't. We, we got a number of complaints, and we were able to determine all of these complaints relate to this same batch. You know, a batch is a. Uh, I'm not Mr. Computer either, but it's a mm -hmm. computer processing term. They know at a certain date, a certain time, they ran these 708 ballots together in one batch. All the complaints we had related to one batch, we brought this to their attention. They were able to determine this is where the problem was. We have no evidence that there was any problem anywhere else. I would think if this was, um, 708 is a pretty small batch, I'm told, so I would think if there was problems elsewhere, we would have had complaints elsewhere, and we have no other complaints that were outside of this. So the, the 708 universe, to answer your question, was not that we had 708 complaints, telephone calls, whatever. We had some number of dozen, whatever it was, identified them all in a particular batch, so that whole batch is the subject of this exercise that we've undertaken because there, the problems were limited and contained to that batch. Now, what the actual problem was inside the printing house, I don't think I, I didn't ask that, I, not, but maybe you know. John. Well, I mean, we've looked at some of the envelopes that were incorrectly addressed. And in some cases, it appeared as though it was the very next line. In other cases, it wasn't the next line. And as board member McBlain and I have discussed, as you and I have discussed, when they came back with the report that said 42 of them or some such number were correct, the other 666 were bad. I had no inclination to accept that at face value and treated the entire 708 as if they could have been or were misdelivered and that the whole 708 needed to be sequestered. If it, I hope that answers your question. It does, sir. And I think, yeah, yeah, your first question, we didn't answer that either, about how we're going to do a potential partial count, which really I think is limited to only two ballots. And I know how we've done it. Why don't you say, I know how we've done it in the past and we've had similar issues. But If, if someone votes a provisional ballot, so we're, we're following the provisional ballot formula, so that if someone cast a ballot in the wrong precinct, perhaps not even in the same school district. They could, they're, they're counts for countywide offices and certain other offices, perhaps for- uh, That they were eligible to that vote. That they were eligible to vote. We need to uh, 
transcribe a ballot. We need to get the right ballot style for that voter and only allow them to vote the contest they were actually entitled to vote. It gets more complicated in a provisional ballot situation because you have to cast that replacement ballot in the provisional ballot precinct where it was cast. Here we're, we're following the same format, but we know that the, the voter, through no fault of their own, received the wrong ballot, but we still can't let them vote for the judge of election, the inspector, or in some cases, perhaps even the school director or the borough council or borough mayor um, in this other jurisdiction. Okay. So of, of the 708, one of the things I was trying to understand and respectfully still don't, and it's not because no one has told me, it's just because it appears to be a complex topic. Of those 708 that were identified as problematic, my understanding of the concerns with those ballots was only, and again, I'm asking to be corrected, was only that there were wrong addresses on the outside of the envelope. Correct. Was there anything incorrect on the inside of the envelope? For example, if I received, you and I both applied, I received Jim Allen's at my home. Uh, and I really, in terms of the, I don't know what you received because we haven't been able to identify what that issue was, but I received yours. If I opened it up on the inside of that uh, envelope, what was the inside of the ballot uh, that had your name on it but my address? Do we know that? All instances that we saw and all instances that we, where we've been able to examine it because it happened to one of our employees. Mm -hmm. uh, we were able to see that the, the insides, the ballot and the ballot return envelope were correct. So, they, they, so if my okay. name came to your address, the insides of the envelope, so the, the, the ballot style for, was for me and the envelope was for me and it had my address on it properly. Okay. And the only thing that was misaddressed was that exterior envelope. Okay. And that was the 703? 708. 708, excuse me. Um, do we have, uh, I think uh, uh, Board Member McBlain sort of touched upon the topic of, uh, we obviously have a listing of folks of the 708 who return their ballots. Do we have a listing of the different uh, folks uh, of the 708 who, I, I don't know what that number is. I don't, maybe that list was provided to me. I'm not saying it wasn't. If it wasn't, I'm, I'll ask for it. I assume it's a public document, the conclusion of this. But the, the number of ballots that were returned there, minus the 708, do we know how many of those folks did not come to vote? Did not return a ballot, did not come to vote? I would assume it's a math question. It's right. 708 minus 429. Okay. 428. That's and minus whatever's in the and whatever list. And whoever voted. Whoever may have come and voted provisionally. Voted provisionally or whatever, yes. So we, would we be able to track that? I'm, I'm interested in the number of, of, of people who may not have had the opportunity to vote. And whether we treated those folks, did, did we do anything to enfranchise those folks? Well, we, we, we remailed. The other so than the remail. All 708 we remailed to. Okay. With an explanatory letter of what mm -hmm. happened and what their options were. Yes. Were these 708, were these part, this file four, my recollection of our, of, of your last meeting was you had indicated to the board that the approximately 35,000 that were, that were responsible to, that were required to be sent out because you received them and processed them, we're heading to the mail house and they said 1015 on them. Was this file four part of the notice you got from the vendor that said, hey, there's a problem. I don't know where these, when, when these, these 5,500 were not mailed out till 1025. No, ent entirely no. separate files. The, so this 708, first, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, it's sorry. The, the first 35,000 that were reported to us as mm -hmm. having been mailed, but it turns out it was closer to 31,000 or 30,000 right. and change. 
And this uh, seven oh eight was were part people of that. Who, no, 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 entirely separate. Okay. Those were people who applied uh, before September twenty nine. And, and earlier, and all the way back to March, where they they signed on for the it's it's called permanent. It should be called annual of uh, list. So these these are all people who applied in that thirty five thousand long ago. Uh, the the file four with the seven hundred and eight voters were people who applied to vote by mail between the dates. I'm approximating now. Between the 16th and the 19th, 17th and the 20th, approximately, of October. So the two have absolutely nothing to do with each other. So they don't, this was not part of the original group that should have been mailed, nor was it part of the it original group that was, the vendor told you was not mailed. This just is it a was, separate file. It was not file. part of file one. It was not part of file two. It was not part of file three. It was not part of file five. Okay. It was file four. Okay, thank you kindly. I appreciate it. I obviously have some other questions as we, as we move through, but I appreciate your time. Thank you. Kindly. Thank you, Mr. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Yeah, I don't really have a lot of questions. But, uh, could could yeah. we ask you to um, identify yourself? You can. My yes, name sir. is Tom Danzi, D-A-N-Z-I, I'm from Middletown Township. Good afternoon, Tom. How are you, guys? So my, my end is more, you know, just a comment. You know, the, this board is, has always had a tough job, and I mean that. And I think it's even, you need to consider, it's even tougher in this current climate. You know, half, half the county, half the state, half the country doesn't think our vote, our elections have any integrity. So, you know, I'm probably the least smart guy in this room, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, and a process that's this convoluted to allow these votes, and I don't know, they, they could be in my favor, I don't know whose favor they're in, but to allow these votes in such a convoluted, explaining it, I think is, does a disservice to this board. I mean, accident, mistakes happen. We all want every vote to count, and I, I don't think that's a cliche, I think we all want votes to count. But life's not fair sometimes. Sometimes, you're, you know, you're late, you know, sometimes you miss the train. S sometimes your, your votes get screwed up by a vendor, you know. And yes, I get you don't want to penalize the resident, and I don't either. But it, it, it's just crazy to just start allowing votes when, when I don't think you can easily explain it. Maybe you can because you're really smart and you know what you're talking about. The rest, a lot of us are scratching our heads out there. I think you're real. I think I think you're really, 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 you know, have to think about before you start allowing votes like this. It, it's different. Provisionals. You prove they came in to vote. You prove they turned their ballot back in. You know, that's a simple thing. Let, allow them or whatever. But in this case, I'm 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 asking the board to really consider before you start allowing votes that convoluted. You you make a good point, sir. And. One of the things is, uh, you're right, we have to be clear in what we're explaining. And, and I want to make sure you understand, the first 412 of these are people that remailed the second ballot. Like, the first 412, there's, there's no issue with this other than they got a piece that was wrong, they got a piece that was right, they voted the right piece. In a few minutes, we're going to get to this, you know, number 413 through 429. Those 16, those are the ones I think there's you're no concerned about. human error at that point, correct? Or for, it, it's 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 a it's a one hundred percent guaranteed. You can guarantee us that not one person voted or didn't vote that shouldn't have. On the first four twelve, yes. As much as we can do that with anybody else, I mean, there's always a potential something in the background. It's go or a question, you get a tricky answer. But as much as we can be sure that people are voting the right ballot for those four twelve, it's the same as the other thirty five thousand we mailed out. It's just those four hundred twelve people got something that was wrong then got something that was right, voted the, the, the ballot that was right. So for those 412, that's why I want to take it first. I think it's, that's not a big issue, but your, your comments are, 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 are well said, and I think you do express the views of a lot of people with respect to those other 16, and we're going to have to think long and hard before we deal with those other 16. So is there other public comment? I, if I may also address, 
I understand your concerns, and we, we reviewed all of these processes with the court. We didn't just unilaterally you know, say, hey, we just want to do this. Uh, so we went through the steps, and the court sanctioned this process that we're following. But the more important thing I want you to know is that that may not be the last court. If it affects a contest in Middletown or anywhere else, uh, some other court could come along and say, you know what, these particular votes should not have been added. And we are processing these ways in a separate batch so that if and when another court were to come along or a candidate were to su successfully argue that these ballots should not have been counted, we can pull these back. These can be removed from the count. Right, right, so they're not, they're not being, so I, I just want to assure you, because I think your question is 100% spot on. I just want to assure you that, you know, this will still be a carton of eggs. It's not like we'll put the eggs in an omelet and then you can't find which egg it is. My last comment is just think about your explanation. Judges, this, rulings. Now, if there were good votes, why didn't you just count them? They're, they're in front of the board. They're in front of judges. It, you know, it just seems to me that that makes your, your job look, you know, harder and look, and, and like I said, trying to make people understand that we have fairer, I think it's important. I want us to be able to show to our constituents and tell them everything is fine. It's a good election. And I think that's important. This makes it hard. I'm sorry, Kevin. On the judge's point, just so folks are clear, um, other parties brought a preemptive lawsuit before many of these ballots even came back to us, and that's why the matter was in front of court. So uh, that's why I was a judge of elections in Haverford for 15 years, and I agree that the vast majority of poll workers work hard and, and do their best to deliver a fair uh, place to vote. Um, but the, the problem, I guess, is partly uh, with the paper ballots. But as far as what you're talking about, the 700 or so ballots that were segregated, you know, I, like Mr. Danzi said, I think some of us are still unclear, and I'm a lawyer, as to what happened, how it happened, and, and whether the, the rectification of it all was really successful. And then you have the issue of there's 250 ballots, may not relate to this, but it was part of the court case that counsel mentioned, that Mr. Allen hand-delivered to the quadrangle. And the question comes up, well, first of all, was that legal? They're supposed to be mailed out. Number two, what was the consideration for doing that? Three, were other places, did they get hand-delivered ballots? And if not, why only the quadrangle? So when you have these kind of things, my view is, why not an audit of the disputed things? Because all I hear about is transparency um, in the papers from certain parties, certain individuals. To me, let's be transparent. Let's do an independent audit, make sure if they're counted it was right, um, these other ballots that were hand delivered, how did that happen? You know, is that fair? Should they be counted? Um, and who knows how many other things? So, you know, there are just some questions I have. And sure, as a candidate, I'm, I'm disappointed to see that I didn't win. But, and I'll take a loss. I'm a trial lawyer. If I lose fair and square, I'll accept that and walk away. But this election has left me wondering, was it really fair? Was it, did it have the integrity that one of our greatest things in this country has, is the right to vote? Was it, was there integrity? So I have some other comments. I don't know if I'll get to them, but that's all I would say. All right, I, I thank you. And if, if you uh, won an audit, right, you're a lawyer, do you understand the election code? There's a procedure in the election code that within so many days after we certify the result, which is still two weeks away, you can request that. You can request a re-canvas, you can go through the statutory procedure and, and you can have that done. So the, the, the code makes provision for just what you're asking for if, if you want to pursue it. But can you do that, if you guys decide, let's do an audit or an independent recount, can you do that yourself in order that? I, I, don't, I don't know, I mean, the, the code sets forth what we have to do, right? We have uh, the, the canvas, there's a certain audit that takes place as part of the canvas by the, by the canvas board where they audit a certain number of the precincts. It's, it's all set forth in the code and it's part of the procedure. And their audit of the, 
I think it's 2% of the precincts that, that they go and they audit, is kind of what you're asking for. It's, it's an audit. It's, it's a, for those of you who aren't familiar with the uh, canvassing board, it's uh, 14 members. Uh, 18. 18. 18 members. Half nine, appointed nine Dems, nine R's. By one party, half appointed by the other party. And they have certain very specific duties that they perform under the election code that look to check the integrity of the, of the count, of the canvas, of what took place. And in particular, one of those things is this, uh, this audit of 2% of the precincts. So it, it does happen. And then, of course, uh, any uh, uh, elector can request a, uh, a, 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 a re-canvas. You have to have three electors, actually. But you know, the, the procedure, it's in the code. And it, it happens from time to time. And, and we've done it, and we comply with it. I would also add there is a statewide risk limiting audit as well. Um, and uh, just to clarify a point, you mentioned that the ballots are obligated to be mailed out. Uh, that's incorrect. Section 1305 of the election code is entitled delivering or mailing ballots. And section 1305D is also entitled delivering or mailing ballots. So these ballots can be delivered or mailed. Well, I think I said, I wasn't sure if it was legal, but if they're delivered, is there a law as to who can deliver them, how they're delivered, and, and things like that? I don't know election law. That's your expertise. We're just here trying to get... Yeah, I think, I think that, that might, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I address a couple of things. I think that might be something that, that gets raised eventually, or these quadrangle ballots, you know, whether it's mailed or whether it's delivered. But it certainly is the case that... Everybody who was in the same position of the residents at the quadrangle were not afforded the same opportunity. Um, and just from appearances sake, uh, it gives a bad appearance that a bunch of rich white people in Haverford, you know, were given spe preferential treatment um, over something. Now, I'm not, again, I'm not disparaging any efforts that were done. I think it was trying to, to have a, a practical solution to a problem. Um, but that being said, you know, we also have to be cognizant that, you know, not everybody gets treated this, the same way if we do it like that. Um, I do, uh, I, I understand the Mr. Ruggieri's comments. I would say in terms of an audit, we're not through the first count yet. <laughs> you know, uh, what we're up to is trying to decide, you know, which ballots, you know, now that we're sort of at the end and you've got the irregular stuff at the end, you know, we have counted... 140,000 ballots or whatever it is so far. Now we're down to that last thousand that fit in some strange category, and we're trying to decide which ones to count. You know, when we talk about an audit too, you know, I want to make sure that um, there's, there's confidence in what we run through the machines because when we're talking about just taking the ballots and running them through the machines again, we're probably either going to get the same number or a very similar number. You're just running them through the machines, you know. We want to make sure that those ballots, where they came from, you know, that, that they are qualified to be tabulated a, as a ballot because just simply running them through the machine, just like the old machines, you know, putting the cartridges in and reading the numbers again, you know, it's going to give you the same result. You know, it's a matter of which, which universe of ballots are going through there. So that's what we're working on now and trying to, to, to give some confidence to the public. I, Again, I, I know I sound like a broken record, Mr. Chairman, but I say this is the problem. I think that, you know, I, I know I've spent dozens of hours talking about these ballots, you know, thus far. And, you know, it probably sounds Greek to people that are sitting at home listening and watching and figure this is my goodness. And it just points out that the whole system that has been created by Act 77 and the, the ancient election code from the 1930s, you know, just can't keep up. I, I point out, if you look and see, just in the surrounding counties, Chester County, they've got a mess, too. Montgomery County's got a mess. Philadelphia's got a mess. You know, I think what our legislature needs to recognize is the system that they have created, even for the largest of counties, you know, even if they were adequately staffed, you know, with the best machines, um, is not manageable some, in, in many of these circumstances. So I'm probably off topic of the, this right now, but I, yeah, I thank but it's Yeah, but it's... I don't, I don't think we have a mess. I mean, I think Mr. Allen has described a very diligent and detailed process conducted by our bureau to try so to... So the other counties had a mess. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, but I also think, I think the, the, the spirit of your remarks are accurate, that 
when, when I started this 15 or 20 years ago, it was seemingly 100 times simpler. And it has become incredibly, incredibly complicated and difficult to the point where I, I empathize with those of you in the public who say, we don't even understand what you're talking about. And it's because there's layer upon layer upon layer of regulation and complication. And we really are trying to do our best, right? And we really are trying to make sure everybody has a chance to vote. And we really are trying to count them in the fairest way possible. And you know, that's why we're here today looking, how do we deal with this mistake that was made in the mailing in a way that's fair to the voters and fair to the people who are on the ballot and fair to the party officials who, who want people to have confidence uh, uh, in their election. So, um, you know, recognize that certainly everyone who works uh, at the Bureau of Elections, I've known it from my experience. I think John will say the same thing with his experience in the county and just being down there the, the, through, through this election and actually through the last couple of elections. They're trying hard and they're trying hard to accomplish those, those goals. And uh, it's, a, it's a, a difficult and, and, and complicated uh, task that gets harder every, every time, it seems. Yes, sir. Yes. I was going to say my name, but I prefer to keep my privacy. <laughs> well, uh, hold on a second. A public meeting requires you to identify yourself. Um, well, I don't know what kind of uh, retribution I might face for the things I say, so I would prefer to keep my privacy. I mean, how, how can you tell me to say what my name is? I don't know who's listening. I don't want people to know who I am, but I'm a resident of Delaware County. If you would prefer to send your comment in by email or in some other format to the board, you can do that, and that way you don't have to speak at a public meeting, but the established protocol for public meeting speakers. Is that a law or is that just protocol? Because if it's protocol, the, then I would uh, rather not listen to it. No, that's I think my everybody understanding would understand. of the public meeting law. Is that public meeting law that I have to reveal my identity? To, to voice my opinion as an American? Well, if you don't say in your name of, and address, how do we know you're an American? Well, that's right. Many <laughs> people are coming here illegally. I don't know. But I think it is worth noting. Well, well wait a second. Are you going to identify yourself or you're not? No, I prefer not to. Like I said, I don't know what kind of retribution so I'd I'm face. So then I'm going to ask the solicitor for a ruling of whether you can so give testimony So my ruling is that, that you're, you would, you're not entitled to speak at a public meeting without identifying yourself and your address, but you are welcome to submit your comments, and we can give you an email address right now where you can submit your comments that will be shared with the board. All right. Then I'll, uh, my name is uh, Elijah. What's your last name, Elijah? Johnson. And what town do you live in, sir? I live in the town of Delaware County. That's not a town, sir. What town do you live in? Uh, Lansdowne. And what precinct? I'm not I don't know give you, precinct. You're not going to have to give you a street address, but you have what? to give you You didn't ask them their precincts and they, what town. They, they volunteered them. No, they just said but, their name. Well, Mr. Pupio didn't because he's a lawyer and he's well-known and we know where to find Mr. Pupio. But everyone else did. Well, I don't want you to find me. <laughs> I think this is ridiculous. And this is voter intimidation. It's not voter intimidation, sir. You're not here to vote. I have an opinion. That's all. I don't know and, why and I you cannot can voice it. You can submit the opinion in writing, but to participate and give testimony. Okay, well, I already meeting, said my name and my yourself. town, and I don't know what precinct it is. Okay, fair enough. Go ahead. Um, first off, I think it's important to note the way you began the entire meeting. This was a successful election. Everything was readable. All the tests were proven. Uh, we exceeded all deadlines. We did remarkably well. I think it's important for everybody to note that everything after what they said has proven the very opposite, that it wasn't success successful. And the reason, very reason we're here today is because of these problems. Uh, and I think that's very dishonest to start that way. Uh, John receives Joe ballots and this went to this address, but, and then you refer to, but I like to call it the Good Samaritan uh, procedure or whatever he said. What about all the bad Samaritans? Uh, these are very biased and objective statements that we're all listening to today. Your name. How can you offer opinion? No, he did. He gave his name and address. He gave his name and his time. Um, the very fact that we are basing our elections on verifying signatures and don't have any type of voter ID is laughable. Until there is some type of voter ID, it will always be laughable, and we will always be guessing whether there is any type of integrity in this system. And so far, 
we've been talking about all the mistakes that supposedly have been caught. But what about all the mistakes that have not been caught? Everything today is all human fallibility. Um, wrong address, just on, on and on and on. Um, we still don't know what the purpose of a mail-in ballot is when for decades we've had absentee ballots uh, that solve the very problems we're facing. The mail-in ballots have to end, and I think a push to end it needs to begin now. And uh, lastly, sir, I don't think it's right that you should get up here and say that you're not smarter or they might be smarter. I think you might be one of the smarter ones in the room. So don't do yourself that disservice. Um, one thing I will say, because I was there at election day all day, all day long, these paper ballots, people would go in and wouldn't come out for 45 minutes. Taking 45 minutes to vote is a joke. Whereas my whole life since a little boy, I would go in the little booth with my mom or my dad, boom, 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 and you're out. 45 minutes to fill in, this is a joke. These are tactics to suppress voters, to keep people from getting out. And they might say that's an objective statement, but I'll offer one objective st or subjective statement against all theirs. But the whole thing is ridiculous. The whole thing is ridiculous. The mail-in ballots have to change. We wouldn't be here today. We've never had, I was just talking to a friend of mine, a great CPA in the local area. And he was saying, you know, one of the big things, it was in 1964 when Johnson was elected, he said it was such a big deal, they had to wait till after midnight to find out, or was it 62, that Johnson was elected. Whereas every time for years and years and years, we have known the results by election night and we cannot, we cannot accept any, anything less than that. We, we, we are moving backwards by going days and weeks into, uh, days and weeks into uh, these elections and we still don't know the results. And that, those are my opinions. I see the law enforcement's rise, which I, Maybe that's a sign of intimidation, too, so I ought to sit down. No, th thank no, you, no, sir. No, no, nobody's I, attempting to intimidate you. I, and I do want to address yeah. four items that were incorrect. Each one of the mail-in applications and each one of the absentee applications is required to be backed up by uh, ID. That's, that's the first step. Any that are not? are held back and not included in the vote. Next, all of the items that we're talking about, unlike in the precinct polling place, unlike all other mail-in or absentee ballots, are subject and have been subject to signature verification. Next, I appreciate greatly the reference to the boom, 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 and you're out under the old system because I've had a, a wonderful opportunity to talk with a number of voters about the old system, but the old system also had something that the new system doesn't, and that's straight party voting. So boom, 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 and you're out happens when you're able to pick your party. It marks all your selections. If you want to cross over, you could. But that was one of the changes in Act 77. They got rid of straight party voting, and they went to, and it was a bipartisan, and by bipartisan, I mean the votes were massive in, in the legislature. This wasn't one party or the other dominating the, the discussion. Act 77, were, 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 all the provisions were, were approved by massive margins. And lastly, as far as not knowing results by election night, I couldn't agree with you more. I would be so satisfied if we could, and this is, the, this is the truth in 67 counties in this Commonwealth, every election jurisdiction, every election official I know, can't wait until they address the law so that we can do pre-canvassing, meaning not tabulating votes, but actually processing ballots, just like during election day, that scanner is processing ballots from the minute the polls open 
until the minute the polls closed or the last person who arrived at 8 p.m. cast their ballot. And only then they tabulate. And every county official I've talked with and just attended in August a meeting of all 67 of them uh, agrees that we need to begin to pre-canvas before election night because right now we're handcuffed. And you can't, it's in handcuffed in two ways. You can't even discover problems that might have occurred with the printing of the mail-in ballots until election day when you open those envelopes. So I agree with you. There are certain things that, want, that you, you want to change, but I just want to emphasize to you that every one of the voters that we're talking about today produced voter ID. Every one of the voters we talked about today is going through signature verification. And it does take longer to vote because we got rid of straight party voting. But on election night, we're not going to be able to fix that until we're able to start pre-canvassing election results before uh, election day. That's it. Did you want to speak next? <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Debbie Tricello, and I just have a few questions, okay? And you're from Falcroft, right? No. no. Oh, I'm sorry. She got Good. Original. That was good. Well, I, you have to give your, your location. I thought Upper I knew Providence. It. I would call it your father. Your father. Third, Third precinct. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, are we just talking about the 708 ballots right now? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Other public comment can come later. And you haven't addressed anything else other than the 708, right? Correct. Okay. And I just have a few there. questions with regard to those. Yes, ma'am. And... Um, these 708, were they uh, some of the ballots that were supposed to be received by noon on Friday, or were these 708 to be received at any time? These were regular uh, mail ballots, so they were due uh, on election day. Okay. Um, and... So when these 708 came in, was there somebody trying to pull them out of the bunches? Short answer is yes. If you want, we, we, we uh, tried to give a little greater explanation before, if you want the details of what had that happened, but the short answer is yes. As they came in, they were all they would put aside. They si yes. put aside. Okay. So um, is it safe to say that none of these 708 were counted yet? That's correct. That's what we're here for today. Of the 708 mm -hmm. that there was an issue with and we remailed, we got 429 back that are potentially to be counted, and we're here today to vote about whether or not we count those 429. Okay. Um, and can you say whether any of those might have been accidentally counted and then taken back out? Um, they, none they of them have been opened yet. Been. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're, still, still, they're, still, they're still sealed, sealed in sealed. the envelopes. Yeah. Great. That's all I wanted to know. Okay. Uh, with regard and to Debbie, I did ask the question of Mr. Allen. When I, I had some of the same questions you did. I asked him, number one, uh, the, the first ballots that were mailed to any of these folks, did we screen to make sure that none of those were counted? And the answer I got was correct. Yes, we've screened. They were not counted. And then number two, uh, did we also screen to determine whether or not any of these people voted at the polls on election day, rightly or wrongly, you know, or voted by provisional ballot? And he says, yes, we have taken a look at that, and we've ensured that that's there so that these, if they're counted, it will be the only vote from those voters. So it's already been checked to see whether these 429 might have had a provisional ballot hanging out there. Yes. You, you already looked for that. Okay. Um, okay. That's all my questions for now. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And we are only referring to the 708. Yes, sir. My questions went when regarding the, the 708. One, how do, we, how do we verify that none of the other files were... Uh, done the same way as, as the, the file four. Right. I know who you are. Why don't you just tell everybody? I'm sorry. I'm Larry Wigan. I'm from Marcus Hook, too. So um, 
we've not run across that issue with any other ballots and any other, you know, with any of the other mailings. Uh, so, and, and, and I, I would be the first to be concerned, to share that concern if, if, if we had. Uh, all of the complaints, all of the, the, you know, the signatures where it didn't match the name have been within that, with only the, the ones that have been returned out of that batch of 708. Okay. And as to the, the countings, and we're, we're saying that we're going to do partial counts, we're rejecting ballots for not being placed into the secrecy envelope. So this is another chain of custody wrinkle too. Why would they not be rejected in the same fashion that, say, something comes in without the secrecy envelope would be? Well, we're, we're going to vote on that, right? I mean, I think, you know, the, the way I've tried to frame it is the first 412, first 412 are people got a bad piece of mail, they got a new piece of mail, they voted it. Those are very straightforward. There's none of these issues about anything irregular other than the fact that they got a bad piece of mail that didn't get voted, then they got a good piece of mail and voted. But for these remaining 16, I, I think we're going to think about those issues uh, uh, very carefully. I think one of the distinctions, though, is these folks had a problem with their ballot through no fault of their own. They had a problem with their ballot because of ultimately our fault, our vendor's fault. Okay. The Board of Elections put a, put a bad ballot in their hand. If you don't sign your ballot or you don't follow the directions and date your ballot or whatever, well, that's on the voter because they didn't follow the rules. This is, we didn't give them the proper thing to vote. Now, we tried to remedy that, right? We gave them a second ballot. We, we sent them a letter. We hope they got it. But, you know, we still are going to have to deal with what do we do about these 16 folks here who got something in the mail and tried to vote and turns out it was defective and it was wrong through no fault of their own? And that's, that's why we're really having these meetings is for these, figure out what to do with these 16 ballots. And, you know, I think to me and I think for all of us, it's important that we give people the opportunity to vote. You know, somebody, Jim Savage said this <laughs> just the other day and it makes a lot of sense that, you know, a, a passing grade on the election isn't 65, right? A passing grade is 100. 99.9 .9 isn't a passing grade. Like, we've got to be right. And, you know, we talked about we've already counted 130,000, 140,000 votes. I got so many numbers in my head today. But so we've counted 140,000 votes, but we got to figure out what to do with these 16. So we're here about 16 out of a really big universe, but we've, we've got to deal with it. And you, you raised some valid questions, and we're going to talk about it. And, take some votes and, and make a decision about what to do on them. One yeah. of which doesn't have a secrecy envelope. So that is one of the, the Well, that issues. one's probably not going to get, well, exactly. I don't want to consistent predetermine with, anything. And, and, consistent and, with his statement. And, and let me just, just state, because I know this is going out to the universe, um, I, I want every single vote to count. I am a candidate on this ballot, just like Mr. Ruggieri, just like Mr. Sello. So, I, and I don't care which side it goes to, I want to make sure that the, at, not just that we have the integrity, but the appearance, because at this point in our, our day, perception is truth. The perception is not that we have a, an integrity-filled election. I would like to be a conduit to make sure that that is the feeling of the masses, just like most of the people in this room. And I, I don't believe that, that that is what we are able to communicate to the, the folks that are Hey, I have 65,000 plus votes. Okay, so I, I want the 65,000 people that supported me to know, no, no, this, this was done right, and I made sure it was done right, because that's our jobs as civil servants. Like, my background is in law enforcement. It is not in being an, an attorney. So when we speak of issues of chain of custody, chain of custody to me means if one link in the chain's broken, that piece is done. And that's why I asked that. And Mr. Allen, I heard you and the chair go back and forth about one particular voter that I heard, and you can correct me if I heard it incorrectly, that one voter, the signature clearly did not match. So what is the board <laughs> doing with turning that into a law enforcement issue and having that investigated? So we... Uh I don't know specifically what we're doing with this one. Because that would we, go a long way to the public We probably to haven't say. done anything yet, but, you know, we sent 300 and something 
referrals to the district attorney's office in the last election, many of which relating to these kind of things. So, you know, we, the... Uh, and, and at least one of which resulted in a, in a fairly nationally recognized voter fraud guilty, guilty plea. plea. That was last year or this crime? Last year. That was, that was last year. We, we sent we 300 had, in the last, uh, last year's election. I, all, I don't know also, what the number is right now. We also had a referral of two individuals from the primary election to the district attorney's office and received two plea deals from them. So, okay. you know, the, 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 yes, the code yes. requires us to make those referrals, and the code, okay. uh, uh, it's the, the, the standard that has to be met for us to make a referral is, uh, is remarkably low. I think it's where there's a suspicion of improper activity. Sure. So we send, uh, uh, regularly send these kinds of things to and them, and just I would suspect that may happen here. Sorry. Just, just confirming, you're going to continue public comment as you go through the sections, is that correct? Yeah, what we do is, we, rather, to just to, we, we have the comment on the item we're voting on when we get there, and then we have general comment at the end for anything we didn't take a vote on. But we get the input before we vote on the subject that we're voting on. Anybody else on this issue? All right, seeing none. So we have one matter uh, that has been moved and seconded and it would be a motion to uh, accept uh, and count the 412 votes for the persons identified on the exhibit uh, as number one through 412. Do we have board discussion on that? I'll just briefly state that I intend to vote in favor of the motion. Um, I, I um, you know, again, to assure the public, I had many questions uh, about these. I would prefer that we had a board meeting prior to the court hearing, but that's, of course, left the board. I, I get that. Um, but uh, I, I've spent uh, a lot of time talking to Mr. Allen, trying to understand this, talking to the board. Um, I am confident that these 412 uh, ballots are the only ballots uh, that have been cast uh, by uh, these voters and that they were, uh, you know, otherwise legitimate votes um, that, that, that should be counted. Uh, as to, I agree with Mr. Danzi, it says, not just a slogan, we want to make sure, you know, that these votes count. So I intend to vote in favor of the motion. I do as well, for all the reasons that we've gone over and for the diligence of our bureau in reviewing these votes. All right, so let's let's call the question then. So on the first motion, the motion to count the votes identified as uh, uh, lines 1 through 412, all those in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. All right, now, um, I don't know that we need to go... Uh, uh, one by one, but well, at least the first couple will have to go one by one. So let's go to 413, which is uh, uh, Mr. Doherty. So uh, Doherty uh, uh, sent in a ballot uh, that was uh, originally addressed to Jefferson, and then Doherty sent in his uh, remail ballot. So the issue is do we count Doherty's remail ballot? The Jefferson ballot wasn't counted. So can we have a motion to count Mr. Doherty's uh, remail ballot? So moved. Second. Uh, do we want to have discussion on that? All right, I'm ready to vote. I will. I would just. Yeah, just is there, is there any comment on, uh, on Mr. Doherty's ballot? Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor of counting uh, Mr. Doherty, line 413, say aye. 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 That motion carries. 414. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ruantz, she, uh, she's the same category as, as Doherty, uh, Mr. Allen, that she uh, voted uh, one ballot that was not hers, that we did not count, and then she voted her remail ballot. So we'll have a motion to uh, count Ms. Ruantz's ballot. So moved. Second. Uh, any uh, comment on Ms. Uh, Ruantz? Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 M Mr. Chairman, I do think that takes out 426 and 427, which relate to her ballot. Those are recommended no counts, and I think they're resolved. But. Okay, so let's quickly vote on 426 and 427 then. Well, I, it, if I can, I mean, You want to do those separately? Yeah, right, well, let's not, just go in order. Not, oh, I go was going to say, I, uh, maybe, I was going to say, I would make a motion uh, that uh, for the, the, the remainder of the items, um, that they either be counted or not counted according to the recommendation from the Bureau of Elections. Again, we have discussed these one by one already. Um, Fair enough. You know, I've listened Great. to it. I've, I've had, for my own self, I've had the opportunity to, to uh, you know, ask the questions that are needed. I guess the only ones that are close for me about whether or not we partial count, you know, the several uh, that are listed on there. And, 
you know, while again, there's, I, I don't believe, and Mr. Parks can, can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe there's a statutory, um, uh, but but there's no statutory for when the vendor screws the whole thing up and sends it out. But I do yeah, other say, other than we're supposed to fix it. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say that there is statutory authority to do that in the context of provisional ballots. That's correct. And you know, that's the way I I, I look at these. And, um, you know, so I, I, I do believe that all things else being equal, that they have not voted on the machine, that they have not cast a provisional ballot, that we have not counted their original ballot that is either not received or uh, is, is being excluded, that to, 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 to vote the partial, I, I am in agreement with that in this particular situation. So if it makes it rather than vote one by one, I would move to approve these as has been described by Mr. Allen and as recommended on the tabulation sheet. Okay. I, I would second that. So, okay, so fair enough. As I understand the motion, the motion is to follow the uh, uh, staff recommendation with regard to lines uh, 415 through 429. Yes. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, anybody uh, want to comment on that? Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, we are done with that matter. Um, Next on the agenda is the uh, consideration of the uh, uh, issues and recommendations regarding the uh, uh, the envelope insert of absentee ballots. And I understand that the staff was not able to finish preparing that. So we're going to have another meeting later Friday. this week, Friday. Friday it's going to be, 2 be Friday at 2 p.m. We're going to announce it today. So that item, item seven, we will take up on Friday at, uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, item Eight. So do, do I need to formally make, form make a motion to table that? Um, good idea, Mr. McClain. You can tell he's got a lot of experience at these public meetings. Uh, so move the table, item uh, seven. 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 All right, so moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 So seven is on table. Uh, item. Sorry, sorry. Uh, could, could you expand on that just so we understand what's going to be? Yes. Uh, so. Uh, on Friday. Uh, Louis so, uh, yes, sir. So, um, one of the uh, items that uh, came up and uh, was uh, 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 subject to the proceedings uh, before Judge Eckel was, in addition to the mistake that the vendor made, we internally in our office, our staff, made a mistake with respect to 65 uh, ballots and misstuffed the envelopes. In other words, sent persons the wrong ballot in the in the wrong envelope. And similarly, we sent a letter. We uh, uh, had a, uh, a replacement ballot sent, and we will uh, have a list similar to the list we had today for those 65 ballots with recommendations on whether or not to count those absentee ballots. And we'll handle that on Friday at 2 o'clock. Yeah, there are exclusively absentee ballots as they opposed to these being mail-ins. Yes, right, 65 are, they, ballots. They, they haven't were, been counted yet. That were, that were, They're still sealed in the envelopes. Right, but they've been, they've been submitted. They've, they've, been, they've, they've been, been returned yes. and otherwise right. complied with the regulations to vote absentee ballot. Thank you. Okay. All right, so item eight, uh, Mr. Allen. Uh, this is also an item that would be tabled. We wanted to make reference to this. Uh, the, vote, the voter registration staff was hoping to get this done by Friday. They did complete it today, but it's not... Uh, ready to be, you know, uh, given to the board. Plus, there were several dozen where uh, one political party objected to uh, the possibility of, of uh, those voters' ballots being included in the counts. And we want to send notification to those voters, either uh, at a minimum, a letter, but if we can also phone, give them a phone call so that they would have the right to appear at the meeting at, at 2 p.m. Friday. So that's why it just made sense to move the uh, item 7 back to Friday as long as we we're already moving item 8 back to Friday. Okay. Um, so moved. So uh, a motion to table uh, number 8. Um, I, 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 I would, if, if Ms. Lungenheim had made that motion, I would second the motion. I did. So moved. Okay. And um, the only thing I would ask is if, if it is possible to um, forward to the board what the um, proposal is much like I mean we're going to get this for the provisionals right yes okay just for the uh, 
how, I was told there was 50 objections. You said a couple dozen. How, how many actual objections? Well, there, there, were, there were originally 50 objections, but I believe the objectors were going back and withdrawing some object, uh, some of their objections. Okay. And I see Ms. Winterbottom nodding her head behind 37. you. So there's Thank 37. You. So yeah. there's potentially 37 objections to be held. Some of them may disappear between now and Friday, but we'll we'll handle them in the same way. And they'll right. be didn't sign it and those kind of things. Like I said, I I, I spent an, an extraordinary amount of time, as we all did, talking and looking at these. If if you're able to send those uh, to us or circulate them to us ahead of Friday, so you know it just might save us some time on Friday being able to take a look at it. Very good. All right. It'll certainly be less than the uh, was it seven thousand or so we had uh, we had last year. <laughs> no, I think nine thousand maybe. Nine thousand. So it'll be thirty-seven's a refreshing. Still more than we ever had in any year other than last year, but uh, but much better. So, so with that request, I do second the motion. All right. Uh, call the question to table number eight. Aye. 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 All right. Eight is tabled. Uh, number nine. Number. This is a uh, number nine is an. Uh, Interesting situation. Uh, I'm going to defer to the solicitor because in my other life I umpire baseball and I've told member McBlain this that um, there's a strike zone and there's out of the strike zone. And uh, I know that varies from umpire to umpire, by the way. And uh, it, <laughs> so anyway, um, this, this past election night, the U.S. Postal Service arrived before 8 p.m. Maybe the, explain to people why this is all relevant. So right. At the wharf yeah. with uh, approximately 14 pieces of mail, which was extraordinarily low. Trays of mail. No, 14 pieces, 14 individual pieces ballots, to be clear. Oh, okay. oh that's it? I 14 thought, ballots. I thought it was trays. Thank which, you. Sorry. Which, which right before 8 p.m., a little before, like a half hour before 8 p.m. No, it was about five minutes before. Five minutes before. The carrier delivery person from the Postal Service returns to the Chester Post Office. Well, uh, if, if you'd like, I can step in because I've interviewed three people at the Post Office about this. Take um, it, yes, please. So let's start with just everybody. Yeah. So, so some of the people here aren't as inside baseball. Yeah, sure. We have to get the mail-in ballots back in the Board of Elections before 8 o'clock on Election Day before the close of the polls. That's why 8 o'clock is relevant. Okay. The only exception would be any ballots that were subject to a later deadline by virtue of a court order by Judge Ackle. So we're putting those ballots to the side for now. Other than that court order and that specific limited universe of ballots, uh, by the way, that request to extend that deadline was, I think, a joint request of the parties that were in front of Judge Ackle. Uh, in any event, it was memorialized in her order. Um, other than that, the ballots have to be in our possession or in our drop box by 8 p.m. on election night. Um, and to be clear, what the code says is, doesn't say that thou shalt not count ballots received after eight. It used to say that, but there have been amendments since it used to say that, and it now says thou shalt count ballots received by 8 p.m. The thou shalt not part is gone. So. As a general proposition, we, of course, work with the post office to get those ballots in our hands by 8. The person came over from the post office, delivered 14 ballots at about five minutes before 8. Uh, according to my uh, interviews with that driver, with that driver's supervisor, who's the PM supervisor at the Chester Station uh, post office, and with the postmaster of the Chester Station post office, what happened was a about a tray and a half of ballots that had been gathered since the last delivery the prior day had been set aside to be brought over to the Board of Elections by 8 p.m. on Tuesday. Um, the 14 ballot, they were set aside because the Postal Service knew that there would be some number undetermined at the time of ballots that came in during the day on Tuesday and they wanted to make sure those were included in the delivery. Well, the 14 ballots that came in during the day on Tuesday were the 14 that the delivery person brought over. The delivery person, due to a miscommunication, didn't realize that there was the tray and a half that had been set aside to be brought over. So when he first came over, he only brought the 14, thinking they were the only ones. While he was on his way over to the wharf, uh, where our offices are, 
to make that delivery, he got a call from the PM supervisor saying, hey, there's a tray and a half of ballots back here, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I didn't realize they were there. So at that point, he's already in our parking lot. He delivers the 14, he goes back to Chester Station, he picks up the tray and a half that he forgot, he brings them back. Those are delivered according to the Postal Service ballot log at 8.09 p.m. So that's after eight o'clock. So the question for the board, once you back out some number of those ballots, which are subject to the Judge Echol order, allowing the return of the ballots by 5 p.m. on Friday, you have some universe of ballots that uh, this board needs to consider whether to count because they were delivered after 8 o'clock p.m., but due only to the fact that the driver forgot to bring them when he brought the others. If he had brought them and they've been sitting in the post office all day, according to all three people I talked to at the post, or at least the two senior people I talked to at the post office who realized they were there, they would have been delivered with the other 14, but the driver just didn't know it when he first came over. Now, I have prepared a memorandum, uh, a legal memorandum with an analysis of the relevant statutory language, the statutory history, and the governing case law. I circulated to that to the members of this board uh, and Mr. Allen uh, and Mr. Martin on uh, Friday, the 5th. Uh, and um, since that's a legal analysis, I will not discuss it more uh, extensively here, but suffice to say, uh, the members of this board have had the uh, have had that uh, since Friday. Does somebody want to make a motion? I'll get to the comment in a minute. So I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to consider the approval of, of those ballots just so that we can discuss it. Okay, I'll second that motion. All right. Um, let's hear from the public. Uh, yeah. If you guys know, My Tom Nancy, uh, Middletown, if you guys know where we stand, but I just kind of a smart aleck question, but do we know how many people showed up at the polls to vote throughout the county after 8 o'clock? Because those doors are generally locked. I've been there. I don't know of any that happened in the second district of Middletown, although I, I wasn't there. I, uh, and I mean that. And have we tried to contact anybody that got there late, that was turned away, and, and, and make sure they get their chance to you know, maybe maybe they're stuck in traffic. Maybe the mail truck was in front of them, and slowed them up a little. To be clear, every one of these ballots is signed and dated before election day. They were okay. already in the post office waiting delivery on election I, I day morning. So those rules. voters did vote actually before election but day. You can't have rules unless you enforce them. What, what, don't have any rules. Just toss them all out. But I do know that some people showed up at, at eight o'clock. The doors were locked and they couldn't vote throughout the county, and I just think that's a fair, something you need to certainly consider as your um, debating. Uh, point, point, point made, Ms. Trisola. So, uh, so this tray that came at 809, was that counted yet? No. Ma'am, no all of these ballots are unopened, they've been segregated, and the that's what this hearing's to determine. They're, they're, they're sitting in the Board of Elections, okay. and we're here today to decide, I do we count them? I don't want to assume anything. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Understood. Don't you yeah. think that's better? Mm -hmm. And if they, and if okay. they, if we do vote to count them, they can be counted in such a way that they're in a unique batch, so that if we're appealed and the court decides they shouldn't have been counted, that all those can be all can be backed out. I'm not angry. I'm not assuming anything about this tray. So please don't think that. I just wanted to ask some simple questions. Oh, no, and I only offered that because it's kind of a logical follow-on that, you know, we haven't counted them, and even if we do count them, we can, we can and we will count them in such a way that if later on somebody decides they shouldn't have been counted, they could be. Or if we vote today not to count them, then somebody can go to court and get an order and tell us to count them, and we'll be able to count them, so. Um, do you know about how many there are? Two hundred. There are 251, so there were 320 in that in the in the tray, but 69 of those 320 were already covered by a court order that said we needed to count those. They, by, if they were received the by Friday 5 p.m. on Friday. Ones? I don't mean to 
They were right. they were either batch fours or of the fifty five hundred that arrived late. I know it's a pain. No, no, no. It's and I, and it's I perfectly. The magnitude of, of what it is to conduct an election with one hundred and fifty thousand plus. But you guys all floated like five different numbers out there. Yeah, let's let's it's go over the numbers again. So it's okay. so the eight oh nine p.m. delivery included 320 ballot envelopes. Okay. Of those, 69 were already covered by a court order that said if these arrive by Friday, they need okay. to be counted because of a, a mailing issue. And that was part of the litigation that was brought by um, uh, one of the political parties. So that leaves, minus those 69, which already were court ordered to be uh, counted, that leaves 251 that the board is deciding whether to uh, go through those and, and count those. Sorry. Okay. And so, because I am short and this is like in my face. Okay. So... On election day, this is this the total amount that was received from the post office on election day? The the three hundred and twenty plus the fourteen, which are not in question because they came in time and they'll be counted in the ordinary course, would be the total number of ballots received on election day through the post office, correct. Okay. These are only post office ballots. This does not include ballots people dropped in drop boxes because that's a totally different and, matter. And mind you, that our experience since we have this drop box system the last two years is that a lot of folks don't mail things at the last minute anymore. We used to get huge volumes of mail you know, in the last couple of days. We don't get that anymore because in the last couple of days we get huge volumes in the drop boxes because people are more comfortable that it'll be timely delivered than if they drop it in the post office. So I can gotcha. see from the look on your face, you're kind of confused. How come there's only 200 or 300 ballots in the post office on the last day? But it's Excuse because me. we get so many in the drop boxes at the end. We, we don't get that many in the mail. Well, I thought that given it's a countywide election that I'm surprised that it was only a few hundred votes, you know, on election day. But... You, you had been receiving mail-in ballots every day prior to that. That's correct. <clears throat> Do we know how many mail-in ballots were received by Election Day, we other do. than the 312? But I would respectfully say that that's outside the scope of the motion, so. Oh. But if we have it. it uh, yeah, it's, it's more than 34,000, so. By Election Day? Well, it, it, Yes, by election day, 34,000 plus okay. some that uh, could not be counted. So it's more than 34,000, some that could not be counted because uh, um, they weren't signed or dated or what have you. Okay, so it's encouraging to know that we got most of them yeah, back yeah, by it's not just post office. election day. You know. so, so to your point, it's a mm -hmm. great question, uh, only because I'm a geek about this stuff. It, 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 but... Before Election Day, like a week out, most everything we're getting is through the mail. Mm. And just a, a, like a, a small percentage, like 20%, is Dropbox. But then in those last days, like the chairman was saying, people are like, I'm not dropping this in the mail. Right. I'm taking this to a Dropbox. Get there in time. Right, right. Okay, so I understand that. Um, do we know if this gentleman was a new employee because I would imagine that the post office kind of, you know, the employees are used to this election day. Look for the I, I did not to go. Uh, inquire as to his employment history with the post office. I do not know the answer to your question. Just was wondering, you know, you would think that he would look for a tray before he went. But, well, um, I suspect that the reason he got a call while he was out was because the Postal Service is, has become hypersensitive to the point that people can lose their jobs if they let election mail languish. Yeah. So. That's uh, like a big thing. That's, yes. That's why I had some questions. Okay. Uh, that's it. 
Thank you. Is there other comment? <clears throat> I would just reiterate the, the same thing the other gentleman said. Mr. Allen, I appreciate your analogy, but I'll give you an analogy too. Them's the rules, them's the rules. Okay, and when you continue to allow exception after exception after exception, you know, this is, what, the third cycle here, two generals in a primary, and we're allowing another, another exception. It, again, the public perception is that we have a fallacy with the mail-in. So I would respectfully put that to the board that we, we need to really dial down on how many times we're going to make an exception. And I, I can appreciate that they were in the post office. I do. Again, I want everybody's vote to count. I don't care which side it's on. But again, perception is truth to the public. And if we continue to allow exception after exception, it, that, that just goes to the integrity of the mail-in, which is what you can see everyone is, is attacking. So th that's just my two cents on that. I'm not attacking anything. I just had some questions. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I, my name is Jamila O'Neill. Um, I'm not sure what border precinct I come from, but I live in a city of Chester. I just want to say I appreciate everyone that is here today taking their time out. My concern um, with these um, ballots that were left at the post office, I would like you to consider the fact that um, what I heard was that the postal worker kind of assumed how many ballots there would be. So that lets me know that there's fluidity, too much fluidity, as you know, both of these gentlemen said, in this process. So I want every vote to count. However, if it's so much fluidity, it's not gonna hold up to anything. Um, transparency, yeah, but it's really about accountability because we can make that worker accountable, but the decision that you guys make, we really set you as you know, honored public servants accountable to the decision to say, you know what, um, we allowed this because this. How would the postal worker kind of assume if there wasn't a concrete standard for receiving these ballots? So that's just one thing to consider. The other thing to consider is, do, is there like a risk management uh, breakout group or something that you guys have to put in place um, these tragedies that are happening with the ballots? as they arrive, let's say with the machines, let's say with the envelopes not matching the ballot, is there some type of model? Because the one that I'm hearing doesn't seem to be working, so when something's not working, it's like breakout session. Let's see how we can gather together and get to a touchdown that will, we're not here to suffice, but we're here to set a standard and accountability. I think that's a question that yeah. Yeah, no, I think that is a, a, a good point. I mean, you should know that we uh, sit down after every election and we look at what went right, but more importantly, we look at what went wrong. You know, the, the first election that we did with these machines, we had the drop off uh, after the uh, uh, polls closed on election night here at the courthouse and people waited outside until two o'clock in the morning to be able to drop their stuff off. And we sat down and we said, all right, that was bad. How do we fix that? And we came up with the system that we've deployed now where people were able to drop their things off in short order. And we saw uh, issues with, you know, the way we printed the ballots before and they had to be, uh, they were perforated on the top and they would tear. So we changed how we print the ballots. So we look at what goes wrong and try to solve it. Now, this issue with the post office, I'm not one to pass the buck, you know? I say it all the time, I said it today. The problem with the vendor is the vendor's problem, it's the staff owns that problem, and the three of us own that problem, right? Because we're responsible for everything that happens down the line. We're responsible for what happens with the, with the post office, but you know, I was there that night, I, on election night, I was in the Board of Elections, saw what happened. This fellow just made a mistake, right? He was trying to do the right thing and bring the ballots as close to eight o'clock as possible because he knew they had to be there by eight o'clock. So he, they, the Postal Service waited till close to eight o'clock to send them over. And we've already said, 
we've got to tell them, send the ballots over at 7 o'clock so that if there's some problem, we can fix it before 8 o'clock because we don't want this to happen again. Um, but, you know, it's, it so, happened and now we have to deal with it. So, so how do you determine your uh, final, you know, input or judgment on, is it being determined on, okay, he made a mistake? I'm hearing a lot of mistakes. And we all, I've made mistakes, like many mistakes. So um, how do you determine? Well, we're going to vote today and decide whether or not to count these ballots. I mean, how do we determine that, you know, this, 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 this fellow who was delivering the mail made a mistake? Is he, he, he was there. He fussed up. He said he made a mistake. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think there was any intent for him to do anything wrong. It's a shame that he made this mistake. Uh, part of it was we, you know, left the discretion to the post office to uh, deliver the mail. There was some point, I think our office had given an instruction to bring the mail by 745 or something, and they thought that meant bring the mail at 745. I mean, I, I'm with you. I'm yeah, see, that's what I'm, I'm saying. This is so, it's so fluid. The post office so it's has like, mail sitting the in the post office, and they send somebody to deliver the mail, and they don't deliver the mail. They only deliver part of the mail. And, you know, they, there's there's not much explanation for it other than the individual so be, who was tasked to do it, it made a mistake. So, so would it be fair to, to say, focus. I'm sorry, I don't mean to cut you off. So would it be fair to say that, um, you know, you either follow the rules and keep it standardized because there was an error on communication with, Pick up collection, how the process is always supposed to go. Well, that's certainly what the board so would consider, so but I do want to be clear. There is no rule that says you cannot count a ballot that arrives after eight. The rule, the rule used to say that. The law has been amended, and it now says you must count a ballot that arrives by eight, assuming it otherwise meets the standards. It used to say you can't count a ballot that arrives after eight doesn't say that anymore. So there's a lot of discussion here about follow the rules. I want to be very clear what the law is. The law used to say that. The law does not say that now. I, I just want to add um, two things. One, we, we do carry out the, the laws as they're written. That's our responsibility. That's what we're trying to do the best that we can. I do think there's, there was a vendor issue, and you had asked if there's accountability, and this is important. I've had you know, a lot of people raise this with me, is what's going to happen to the vendor who makes a mistake, right? Because, I mean, the vendor, I believe, is certified by the state. We've had an issue. It's a very serious issue. It has the potential to disenfranchise voters. Any one of them, as uh, the reference to Mr. Savage, is unacceptable if someone's disenfranchised. And I do think there's an actual process that I would appreciate, Mr. Allen, if you would just explain to the group. Well, we're moving off of this issue of the post office at this point, correct? Sorry. You're well, right. I we had, can say it was that. too about risk later, management. We should break out plan and... The, 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 thank you. I'm so I'm sorry. Yeah. Well, sticking with this issue with our vendor, the postal service, and by our vote, vendor I mean both the voters and the election boards. Um, there are two systems that you can use. You can make sure that, uh, as as a client, the election board, we can go in person, and scoop up the mail. Um, and so, and, and the other system is that you can have certain deliveries. For us, only around election time does this become an issue. So moving forward, now that we've had a bad experience with this, we hadn't had one ever before, we can look into making sure that on election night, we go there in person and try to scoop up everything possible an hour before polls close and try to make sure and then tell them anything that arrives between now and 8 p.m., bring it over to try to minimize this risk of in, in this person, the delivery person, only seeing the 14 and not realizing there were another 320 that had arrived since we made our, our previous pickup to 7.20 p.m. before. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. I still have some questions, but I'm going to just go. I thank you. I appreciate you all. Thank I, you. I just have one question that I meant to ask. These 300, did they come from one town or many towns? All over. All, All over. over. Okay, good. <laughs> that lends to credibility. Good afternoon. I'm Donna Cantor, Middletown 4-3. Um, 
I think you have to look at this issue just like we looked at the vendor issue. The voters voted, they mailed in their ballots, they signed off on them days before November 2nd. The post office, by their own admission, had them on November 1st and set them aside rather than deliver them to you early or even the morning of November 2nd. And for those reasons, those votes should all be counted. Those voters shouldn't be disenfranchised because they did what they were supposed to do. They followed the rules, they submitted their ballots. It was a screw up that had nothing to do with the voters, just like the vendor issue had nothing to do with our voters. And for that reason, I'd like you all to vote in favor of counting those ballots. Thank you. Thank you. Is there, is there other comment? Yes, sir. Louis Drawfer again. Um, <clears throat> could, you had said it, I think it's going to be redundant, but just to be clear, solicitor said that it is ballots received before 8 p.m. and because there's no... By 8 p.m. By 8 p.m., yeah. <clears throat> Is there any... I know you're saying it's new law, but there's no precedent... There's no legal interpretation of this. Is that my understanding? Or is that your understanding? There are a number of cases that involve analogous scenarios uh, involving absentee ballots, but keep in mind that many of them were decided under an earlier version of the law sure. that said that ballots received after eight could not be counted. That's not the language anymore in the code. And, and the other thing that's been pointed out is the Pennsylvania Supreme Court last year ruled directed us to count ballots after received after 8 o'clock. Judge Eckel last week ruled, directed us to count ballots received after 8 o'clock. So it's not something that's never been done before, that there is precedent in other contexts of ballots being counted that are received after 8 o'clock. I'm just thinking of the slang, you know, the slippery slope, because it seems like there's if there's specific language about 8 p.m., uh, and then 809 is okay. And then, you know, when does it end? And that's well, the question I have. I think you're setting precedents, or at least you're, you're asserting a precedence, which I'm not terribly sure is sustained by the law. Yes, it may have been interpreted case by case, but I'm, I'm concerned that... Uh, there, 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 are, yeah. there are situations in elections that occur every single election, in every jurisdiction across the country, where, for example... Um, the custodian at the polling place or the pastor who has the key to the polling place does not show up and the poll workers and the voters are alike are stuck outside and there's a provision under the law that okay we're going to keep four, we're going to we're going to close 427 of our precincts at 8 p.m. but in this instance we're going to extend the hour extend the voting by an hour even 2 hours in some court orders so there 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 are there, there are allowances for items like this under the law. I don't want you to, to think that, uh, you know, this is some extreme measure that's suddenly being taken for the first time, because it isn't. No, I, I, I thank you. Or being yeah. considered, I yeah. should say. I don't even know if it's... It was just, I was, I, I'm, I'm seeing that there's, there's language that seems to be clear, and now it's being interpreted equivocally. And I'm, I'm not terribly sure that that's, that's well, your problem. Well, I, I think the language in the old law was clear. It said you may not. The language in the new law says you must count the ones before 8 o'clock. It's silent as to the ones after 8 o'clock. I would submit that it, it's just not your position to open that window and just use it as a vehicle to you know, whatever goes. I, well, uh, I would uh, direct you to the case in Ray Luzerne County Return Board, which is a 1972 decision of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. And I think it presents an interesting sorry, 1972 decision of the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. It presents an interesting analog to the situation. There, there was a challenge to 16 ballots that were marked in red or green ink because the code requires that all ballots be marked in blue ink, black ink, blue black ink, or pencil. The Pennsylvania Supreme Court refused to invalidate those 16 ballots because, and this is a quote from the decision, this section of the code merely assures the validity of ballots marked in blue, black, or blue-black ink, unquote, and does not, quote, spe specify that any other type of marking will necessarily be void, unquote. So that, I think, the reasoning of that Pennsylvania Supreme Court decision seems to 
be something quite analogous to this situation where the code assures the validity of ballots received by eight, but does not necessarily indicate the lack of validity of those received after eight. And furthermore, we have an amendment by the legislature of a prior law that did ensure the invalidity of ballots received after eight. And that amendment seems to indicate the intent of the legislature to create some leeway there. Like a blue letter law, I get it. Um, I just don't see the, um, yes, I do, I get it. I appreciate it, and also thank you for your time. Oh, was that case before the law was changed, the language in the law? That case related to a provision about blue, black, ink. Right. But yes, it was oh, before. That, that was before the, the language was changed. You mean the language about the 8 p.m.? Yes. Yes. You were referring because it's a different code section, but yes. Right. So we're reasoning by analogy the blue black ink language in the code versus the 8 p.m. language in the code. I understand what you're saying, but this is a case that predated the change in the law. Is there any case law that you have for There is, there is. I think you should <laughs> Last read year. The, Yeah, I think you should read that quote from the court. I knew there was. How yep. about that? Hey, uh, the are we having another meeting after this? We're having a meeting on Friday? Friday, Friday. yes. That we'll be able to attend? Because I have some questions, but I, I have to leave at this point. Friday at 2. Uh, the Bukvar case from 2020. B-O-O-C-K-V-A-R. Oh, right. Which also involved the ruling saying that in certain circumstances where there is ambiguity in a code section, the ambiguity should be resolved in favor of protecting the franchise of a voter and not to stand on a technical deficiency that would disenfranchise a voter, which is consistent with the 1972 decision I quoted earlier, the Lucerne County case. Is that a technical decision? I would agree. Or how is that a technical? They, they, they didn't get there on time. Uh, well, again, you're framing the question as being on time or not, and the code section has been changed. It used to say if they're not here by 8, you can't count them. It now does not say that. So, so, so you have the ambiguity of what you do for the ones that arrive after 8, the precedent now, you can allow votes every up to the judge, or what, what would you say the president? Well, I would say that it is up to this board to vote on those uh, on those circumstances. Yes, absolutely. That's I think what this law of Pennsylvania is. Well, obviously, they're dated before. Yeah, 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 they're dated before. All right, is there any new comment? Very briefly, Mr. my Brady, name is George Radner. Beatty, and I'm in Radnor Township. And uh, I just want to point out that this issue relating to these ballots that were signed and dated before Election Day and put in the United States mail and had already arrived at the post office close to this area, that's not important. It's not important whether we count a few hundred more votes or not. What's important is that in this democracy, for the very first time in history, Last year, we had questions about the validity and the integrity of elections. Like never before, we've called it into question. So the public, depending on how you feel, which side of the fence you're on, says, gee, it's all rigged, it's all fixed. It's not rigged, it's not fixed. I know Mr. McBlain is a man of integrity, Mr. Lawrence is, Ms. Lungenheimer is, and, and so is Mr. Parks, Mr. Allen. We're all Americans at the end of the day, and I would urge you all to vote unanimously, because if it's not a unanimous vote, even though we in this room know what really happened, the way it will be framed and spun in the news and everywhere else will be, aha, see, it's rigged. So I would urge you, please, vote unanimously on this so this issue is not turned around and used to further drive a wedge into the American people and help to destroy our democracy. It's very, very important. It really is. It, it matters that we be unanimous on this kind of thing, because if we're not, we're going down that very slippery slope. I, 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 I appreciate I Mr. Mr. I like John McLean, and I think he's a man of integrity, and he understands the gravity of the situation. And I, so. I appreciate, Mr. Bay, your comments, and I'll just make one sort non sequitur comment. I think that's the first time I've been urged by a Democrat to vote unanimously in this government center. <laughs> 
Well, it's the first time, huh? I don't think we have a proper motion, though. I think your motion was to consider the question, right? Is it to actually? Uh, well, I, yeah, it, 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 a motion to approve them, yes. I, just, just to get the. Okay, okay, that's so, what so I understood. The motion, the motion to, to be to, for the purposes of debate. The motion is to approve. It was made. It was seconded by uh, Ms. Longheimer. Does the board have any? Yeah, no, I don't know, Mr. Brady, if your goal is going to be achieved. But I'm inclined to vote in favor of this. I've re reviewed the, the law. I think that the law has been well explained to the extent it's been explained here um, by the solicitor. I think it's um, supported by the law and the statutes to vote in favor of franchising these voters. And so I intend to vote in favor of the uh, approval if that's how the motion was framed. Any other comment? I do. I have a comment. I, I, I will vote against the motion. And I, I don't think it's a bad thing, you know, uh, that's there. Um, it's, it's a difference of opinion. I, I sometimes think perhaps we're, we're all well-experienced lawyers here. And sometimes lawyers, I think, get down in the weeds too much and we lose... Uh, you know, we lose our common sense. Here we have a rule that says it, it, it you know, it, it's got to be received by 8 o'clock. And I understand, Mr. That's not what the rule says. Yeah, and I, well, I, it, is, I, it is, Mr. Parr. I mean, I, I, I read your memo. I, I respectfully don't agree with your conclusion. But that's, I respectfully don't agree with your conclusion. Um, I, I, I think that the, the clear intent is that votes need to be received by 8 o'clock. Here, uh, it aches. You know, because the equities here is that this arrived at 809. So that's so achingly close, you know, that you feel like, you know, boy, if they had only arrived nine minutes earlier. I asked, what if it's 909? You know, what if it was 1109 at night that it arrived? Would we be making the same argument? Would it be the, the, the same thing? What if it was two days later that the post office in Primus said, you know what, we found a tray of envelopes, we found a tray of ballots, it was a mistake, you know, uh, Susie put them back here and we just couldn't, you know, do it. Um, prior to my service on the board, I was at polling places at eight o'clock at night for the last 20 plus years. In, and I would venture to say in every election, primary and general election, there is somebody appears at a polling, I'm at a big polling place, there's a lot of people that come there. But somebody appears at the polling place sometime after 8 o'clock till about 9 o'clock, 9.30, when you're done counting the votes. I distinctly remember in uh, 2019, you, people that worked it may recall that it was pouring rain that night. Um, and I remember a person that arrived less than five minutes after 8 o'clock, drenched in the rain, you know, who had raced from their work in King of Prussia or whatever it was in order to vote, and they were told no. Um, and that was it ached everybody, you know, the judge of election, the candidates, everybody that was there not to let that person vote. If they arrived at 930, you know, which some people have done, you kind of chuckle and you say, oh, man, you missed it by an hour and a half. Um, so there, there's less of inequities. I, I, I agree with Mr. Allen. You know, here I think our job is to call the balls and strikes. And here we can say, hey, it was a great pitch. Um, you know, it had a ton of break on it, but it was outside the strike zone. And, you know, the fact that it was after 8 o'clock here is what sways me. I do agree that we cannot, and I, I've said this at prior meetings, I think part of the reason that the public lost confidence is because so many courts or boards or, you know, uh, other places varied the rules last year. And I, 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 my theme as far as been I want to stick to the rules. So here we can stick to the rules. Somebody may disagree with that. Um, the people that wear the black robes, you know, they have the ability to apply equity, which is really what we're talking about here is, you know, the board to apply equity. I think we need, when there is a statutory provision um, that I think says they have to be here by eight, I think we should apply the statutory provision and let the court deal with equity if that's the case. So for those reasons, I would, I, I, would, I, I, I feel uh, for the, the postal worker, for the voters, but these votes arrived after eight o'clock. So my vote will be no. I, I do feel, sorry, Mr. Chair, if I might. You did um, start this by saying, I think that sometimes lawyers lose common sense. And so I don't think that that um, is what has happened here. We may disagree. You have the right to vote differently. But I don't think that the solicitor with his recommendation or I have lost common sense. Because I also don't agree with you that the statute says as clearly as, as, as you indicate it has. And I think it's been pretty well laid out that it doesn't. But the other thing is, I just think this is an individualized analysis. That's what... I understand if it should be perfect, it really should. And in the end, we all have to say it needs to be perfect, right? Um, and that's what we're striving for. 
But there are imperfections in this world, and there are imperfections here, and we're dealing with them. And each one, as you can see, we've done a careful, individualized analysis. Whether it's on the law, the situation, each different thing, the, the reviews by our bureau, the detailed reviews of signatures, et cetera. And so here we have an individualized situation. Mr. McBlain can disagree, Mr. The, Mr. Chairman can disagree with me. But looking at the facts of the situation, the interviews, the three interviews by our solicitor, the fact that there's a logical, there was no indication of any intent for malfeasance, and I was in law enforcement as well before for, um, for you could argue over a decade, but for at least nine and a half years, and I really value the importance of that. But also if you look at the explanation being logical, a tray was set aside that came in a gap period of time. This was an individual who collected the votes that came logically after uh, that particular day. It, it's not an illogical, there's no reason to think that there's a problem here. So while we may disagree, I have made it clear over the years um, that it is my intent, over the last year and a half, is my intention to try to vote in favor of franchising when I think the law supports it. I think the law supports it here. I think the facts support it here. And I respectfully disagree that I've lost any common sense in doing that uh, with my vote, but I do intend to vote in favor of, of, again, I'm not quite sure how the motion was framed, but in favor of counting these votes. And if I lose, I lose. That's the part, part of democracy and the board. So um, I obviously knew about this, uh, at, if not 809, maybe even a little before 809 on election day. And I've been thinking about it a lot since then. And I'll tell you candidly, I came here today expecting to vote to count these votes because uh, uh, these voters did nothing wrong. They filled out their ballots, they mailed them. I'm absolutely convinced that the folks at the post office just made a, a good natured mistake. But you know, these arguments that I've heard here today about following the rules, exercising discretion, what our duty is, I think that uh, Mr. Parks wrote a, a brilliant um, legal memo. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good piece of, uh, of uh, uh, analysis of the law here. And certainly Act 77 uh, is uh, deficient in many respects, and one of them was in how they drafted this section. And uh, I would make the vote a lot easier if the section was drafted consistent with the previous section that says you may not count votes after eight o'clock. I think there is certainly a, a, a legal argument that can be made for counting uh, ballots uh, uh, after eight o'clock because the way the section's drafted, it only says you must count ballots uh, before eight o'clock. Uh, but at the same time, I uh, don't think that we have the discretion to, uh, to make that legislative interpretation. And uh, I, uh, I hope this is, uh, I'm gonna vote uh, no. I certainly hope that it's appealed and I hope a judge turns it around because I don't like disenfranchising the voters, but I think uh, in good conscience, I'm gonna have to vote no. So let's call the question. All those in favor? Aye. Those opposed? No. No. So the motion fails. Um, next, board members' comments. I did have one comment. Just um, what I was getting at that the solicitor rightly pointed out um, when the, the woman was asking questions about reporting. I also believe that there's a mechanism that we are filling out and following, I believe, but please, Mr. Allen, correct me if I'm wrong, to report the problems with our vendor themselves. They are state certified. And if I'm wrong about that, please correct me, but I thought there was some sort of critical incident reporting in which we will complete so that the vendor, the state is on, on notice about this vendor that's been certified by them of this you know, critical error that we've talked about with some of the mailing issues. Yes, uh, suffice it to say, I have not had the opportunity to complete this paperwork okay. given the difficulties we have run into, um, spending a lot of time in court on uh, and either prepping for it or in court itself the Friday night before and the Saturday of, as well as dealing with the aftermath, as well as administering the cleanup that's had to be done, uh, keeping, bringing people in on Saturday, uh, bringing people, uh, you know, keeping people late to, to go through all these documents and prepare all of this. Uh, but yes, absolutely, there will be reports about issues that are encountered, and we will be filing those with the Department of State. Thank you. Uh, my comments, Mr. Chair, just two, two things. Uh, number one, I, I started, I wanted to repeat it because I feel so strongly about it that I want to thank uh, Mr. Allen and all the staff members, um, you know, who have worked on this election, what the state requires, 
uh, to administer uh, elections nowadays is a Herculean task. Um, and uh, what, what I've observed over the, the last couple weeks uh, from all these ladies and gentlemen really uh, has, has been terrific work uh, for uh, low pay. Um, and, uh, you, you know, I, I thank them for, for their service. And then secondly, um, thus far, I can say, Mr. Chairman, I mean, one of the, you know, I, I did not anticipate sort of being back, at, you know, at a table again in this building. Um, uh, you know, but I did this election board because I thought this was a way to contribute, especially after 2020, uh, to try to reassure the public regarding the integrity uh, of the election. I agree so much with what Mr. Beatty said tonight. We had the opportunity to discuss it after court was that it's so important, no matter which party you are, to assure the public um, that we're doing everything that we can in order to count all the, the votes in a fair way according to the rules. And I can say that in my experience thus far, that is what is occurring in Delaware County. Um, we certainly have to spend a lot of time and, you know, there's certainly issues that you have to tackle, but I, I can, you know, there, there'll be people that are disappointed in the outcome of the election. There'll be people that will be um, uh, excited about it. Uh, there's still some races uh, to be uh, decided um, uh, that, that are close. So no matter how that turns out, Thus far, I can say that I think it's been a fair process and uh, that um, I, 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 I want to reassure the public that, um, you know, everything's being done to make it as fair as possible. And I think it is uh, that far. And being the minority board member, I guess I'm supposed to be in some at least slight fashion, play the devil's advocate. Um, but I think that uh, that the process has been has been fair and honorable so far. And. Uh, I, I, I have no doubt that I uh, expect it to continue that way. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, it seems every election, I'm amazed at how hard our people work. And it's because it just gets harder every single time. And it not only gets harder because of the complications of the voting system and the laws, but also because of the, 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 the discourse in the public. Uh, we had a number of judges of elections who already have turned in their resignations. They've just had it. And uh, I think to the extent we have persons in this room that are elected officials and persons that are involved in the political parties, it's really important to stress to uh, everyone you come in contact with that the election workers are really just trying to do their best. And people make mistakes and vendors make printing mistake and folks at the post office make a mistake uh, and we have to sit here and try to sort it out and, and, and make things happen in a fair way when things have happened that just aren't fair, that people forget to deliver the mail and people make a mistake in putting the wrong ballot in the, in the wrong addressed envelope. Uh, but uh, I know that we are on the board are, are working very hard to ensure that it's a fair election. I know that uh, the staff uh, works uh, uh, incredible uh, amount of hours and time to, to make things happen. Ms. Ms. Winterbottom is here and Mr. Savage is here. And uh, both they and their staffs have uh, made uh, uh, unbelievable efforts in a time when you know, they're shorthanded and they can't get the, the help that they need. Uh, and I just don't know how much longer we can keep doing it. We really need the support of the public uh, to turn things around and to engage in this process and to volunteer to be poll workers and to come to work uh, uh, at the Board of Elections and in the, in the warehouse and in voter registration and in places where we need people to make these elections happen. And uh, I, I can't stress that enough. So I thank uh, uh, everyone. I thank uh, the public for coming here today and sharing your thoughts and feelings on these important issues. Uh, I especially uh, uh, thank uh, our staff who has worked really, really hard to make this happen. And uh, uh, I thank our, 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 our board member. Um, you know, Mr. McBlain uh, has, has been here for, for six weeks and uh, uh, been uh, really a terrific contributor and somebody who has uh, facilitated the discussion. And uh, I think we're, we are doing our best to try to work with everybody involved in the process to make sure they can see what's happening and they feel like they're treated fairly. That's ultimately our goal. So. Um, uh, thank you, Ashley, and, and thank you, John. Thank you, uh, thank you Jim and Manley. And, uh, so, unless anybody has uh, 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 any other uh, board member comment, we do still have a, a public comment item if there's public comment for things that haven't been addressed yet today. I don't see any hands. I see one, Mr. Pupio. Certainly, very briefly, uh, again, thank you, uh, Michael Pupio, uh, Springfield Township. 
You know, I just wanted to make sure there was a gentleman that got up and spoke earlier that uh, seemed to attribute uh, bad intentions towards folks. Uh, and that's what we, echoing what Mr. Beatty had to say, what uh, Board Member McBlain had to say, that, that's what we can't do and the, what we shouldn't do. Uh, I did my very best in court uh, on that day uh, for reasons that uh, I've said on previous uh, appearances before you, and I'll say it again when we debrief. Uh, there are multiple things that, that I think we can include some other folks in that might not necessarily be found in some code, some section, some procedure, but an ability to include some things that might shed some light on that. I did my very best to stand uh, next to everyone because I invested in that system. I invested in that system every, I have, I have had the privilege of running many elections. One, plenty lost some. Um, all you want is the fair and square so that you can then evaluate your performance, your candidate's performance, somebody else's performance. Um, and, you know, I have not experienced, and I wanted to make sure I said it publicly, uh, Mr. Allen has not misled me in any way, shape, or form, never did. Uh, I didn't make any attributions uh, of, of uh, of anything other than uh, the word that Mr. Allen provided on the stand on testimony as to why he took certain actions. You know what those actions may mean or for others to interpret or discuss, they're not for me. Um, and I, I appreciate this board. I appreciate uh, the position that, that Mr. Parks is in. Uh, I get to play that position in some other um, as controversial topics with, uh, with not as much law and brand new things that uh, for institutions that don't usually change. Uh, and, you know, the, anything you provide is a ruling, whether you're correct, incorrect, uh, and it's very difficult to be an attorney for three attorneys. So, thank you. <laughs> They're good, bad, or indifferent doesn't, doesn't come into play. It's, it is Act 77. How, what happens to that is someone else's uh, legislative call, gubernatorial calls. I said to Mr. Allen, let me know when the bus leaves for the rally to count the votes, I'm in. Tell me who to call to, to pre-canvas, I'm in. I, I agree 100%. But prior to any of that changing, which it won't for the next couple of years, even in any one scenario, my goal is to understand this system top to bottom so I can stand behind you and say that. Um, I sat in the chair that Mr. McBlain sat in, being responsible. I'm a lifelong resident of this town, uh, of this county. I've won elections. I've lost elections participating in them. I just want to make sure that I understand them. And when, as, as Mr. Allen said, he's a geek, it's, it's, it's a little bit about what I do as well. You know, I, I guess I'm a geek as well. I'm interested in this system. I think it's important. It's always something that has been of import to me. And I did want to say that, look, everyone else, we may have different points of view and can agree and disagree, but uh, there has not been anything coming from this board or this county that has, that has indicated to me there's in any way, shape, or form malfeasance uh, at all. And any misfeasance was on the part of the vendor. Uh, some communication tips, I would certainly offer those. They don't need to be made in public. But thank you kindly. Michael, uh, thank you. Thank you for your comments. And thank you also just for the professionalism and the dignity that you've exhibited uh, throughout this, uh, this process. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Donna Kanner, Middletown Floor 3 again. I really just wanted to know what the process is going to be for the rest of this election cycle, when people are going to be counting votes, how they're going to be counted, how we're handling the recount for Commonwealth Court. If anybody can point me or give me the answers, that would be great. Yeah, Sir? it's probably a very long answer. Maybe we can give the Reader's Digest uh, <laughs> highlights, and, and you could follow up directly. With so there, there are... Uh, smaller numbers of uh, vote by mail ballots that had to be remade or, or transcribed because they were damaged or whatever. Uh, we still have the uh, 400 uh, provisional ballots. We'll get recommendations on how many of those to be counted either in full or in part or not counted at all. I just received uh, instructions from the board on at least 412 and 16 more of those. So we'll be processing those as well. Um, so th th there isn't a whole lot still out there, but I know there are certain contests where uh, 
even a statewide contest where uh, it, it's it's going to come down to be a very very close contest. So uh, we're going to be processing these by the 13th this Saturday, so that we may certify in Delaware County by the 18th ahead of the deadline, which is the 22nd. We fully anticipate that there could be a statewide uh, recount in the uh, an automatic recount in the contest of uh, the Court of the Commonwealth, for example. We also have an Eddystone uh, borough mayoral race that is currently, last I checked, deadlocked at 50-50. And I don't know that any of the 428 that were approved today <coughs> of even impact Eddystone. Uh, there are a handful of provisional ballots that may. Yes. You're on top of this, so you know where we're going. So anyway, that, that's it. We'll, we'll, be, we'll be winding down our count the 13th so that we can certify on the 18th. Will there be counts tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, or just? Hopefully we'll wrap them up today and tomorrow, but the provisional votes, uh, the ones that are subject to uh, objections, uh, th those are going to be heard on Friday at 2 p.m., and uh, from there, we should be winding everything up Friday and Friday, late Friday afternoon, or probably more, you know, likely Saturday morning. Any You're welcome. The, uh, the, uh, maybe, the maybe I can answer this question before you begin. Yeah. Just, uh, I think one of the questions, perhaps I'm just anticipating, I might get after I leave is, um, as we do our work over the next few days and implement what the board has done, do we anticipate that the website will be updated at all as we go along? Yes. Or are we just waiting? Until, as we go along. As we go along. Okay. And I'm still not clear on the, I believe there was 1,400 provisional ballots. Are, are, have they, any of those been counted or when, are, when will they be counted? No, not, they have not been counted. So. Any time frame on when they would be? Uh, we're we're going to have a meeting on Friday to consider... Uh, the recommendations and any objections. Got so, it. Good. and from probably someone uh, who served on the only board worse than your board, uh, Mr. McBlain could tell you. Um, I, I served uh, 15 years on the Dover County Board of Prison Inspectors. So uh, I do appreciate uh, what you do, and, and I know it's not an easy job. So. All right. I don't see any other comments. So the next meeting. There, there's no. A couple other things I wanted to mention, and um, like I said, 15 years I was a judge of elections, and at 8 o'clock we shut down, and that was it. And it hurt to tell people they couldn't vote if they got there at 5 after. But the point, really, that I wanted to make was the switch from machines to paper ballots. You guys probably don't have much to do with that, I'm guessing, but if you do get together with other boards in the county or in the Commonwealth, and you talk to people who have some say in that, I got so many complaints last November when I was working the polls about doing uh, paper ballots, and then the election this year. By and large, people were not happy with paper ballots, much preferred the old machines. And uh, I think that's part of the problem, too, that we have. Um, and I have one last question. Uh, as I worked all those years in the polls, whenever there was candidates, there were columns. You had Republicans or Democrats, Democrats or Republicans. I've come to understand it was because of whoever the governor is gets the preference. This year, for some reason, there were no columns. They were stacked. And the Democrats were stacked on top of the Republicans in every race. I don't know how that happened. It, it's Just wonder of, about it's it. It's part of Act 77. So when they changed the law, among other things, and we have to have paper ballots and so on and so forth, they changed the way that the ballot has to be organized. So now, the party that holds the governor's office, those candidates' names appear first. If you win both primaries, you then appear second, and then the, the party that doesn't hold the governor's office, those candidates appear third, and then anybody who's an independent who gets on the ballot, you know, like for president, sometimes folks get on as independent, their names will appear next. So rather than each party having its own column, it's by office, and then within the box for the office, they're candidates are listed by political party, the party holding the governor's office being first. In the old days, when it was columns, the first column was the party with the governor's office, the second column, the other party, so on and so forth. 
because you don't have straight party voting anymore, I guess. I don't know why the legislature there's, does what they do. That's fine. There, I there, just yeah, didn't there, know there, why. So. There, yeah, there's a couple of reasons. When you when you switch to the paper ballots, on the old Danaher equipment, you might be able to, um, let's say it was a vote for three type situation. You could vote for one D and two R's, two D's and three and one R, and it would stop you from trying to vote another one. Whereas if you had them in columns, you could have all kinds of overvotes and undervotes. And so they, they looked at that from uh, a practical perspective. Um, it, there, there are other considerations as well, but it was primarily to, to not disenfranchise voters by causing more errors because the old system would block you from making that, you know, that extra decision. The paper ballot doesn't do that. But well, the so. bottom line is the law dictates in very specific terms what the ballot looks like in the order of the candidates. That's that's what I was looking for. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Hi, uh, Louis Tropper again. Uh, two questions. Um, has to do with mail-in ballots. <clears throat> and I know it's long, but I, I'm going to confess my ignorance. I don't understand. <clears throat> Let me do it this way. You've got the, the mail-in ballots that go through a separator. And my question is real simple. It's how do you quantify what the votes that are flattened out, the, the papers that are flattened out from the envelopes? Um, that's the first uh, two questions. That's the first question. How can you quantify that those votes and those envelopes are the same number? How can a poll watcher, how can someone just observing the process have some peace with the idea when they see the envelopes going in one direction, the flattened out ballots going in another? Um, can somebody help me on that? I, I'm, Sorry, real well, basic question. I will defer to Mr. Uh, Allen on this more generally, but uh, or more specifically, but generally speaking, they don't go through a separator. They go through a machine that opens the envelope. doesn't pull the ballot out. A human being pulls the ballot out. But the, the effect is that they will, at some point, the ballot's going to be... Inevitably, important. they have to be to go through the scanner. Correct. Okay, second question. Um, the, um, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, that's good. So I, can I can I say, I think because I think you have a good question because I have the same question sometimes is that after we pull them out which you have to do in order to scan them and flatten them the envelopes get kept over here and the ballots get kept over here is it ever reconciled you know that you have the same number of envelopes that you have number of ballots I, 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 yes that and that I don't understand why I as a poll watcher, I can't somehow have some ability to quantify that, okay, here's a, here's a stack of envelopes and here's a stack of uh, scanned ballots, or vice versa. Well, and I, and I, I just think don't know how and to if do I that. can, I, and yeah. please, I, I, I think you can. Okay. You know, it takes a little bit of effort because every document that we talk about here is open for public inspection once the process is finished. Yeah, I'm going to take up your time then. I'll, if, that's, if there's channels I can go through, I'll find those out. But okay. That, so the second one, this is... Again, confessing ignorance. Um, when you've got the ballots themselves and they go into, I'm going to use the term scanner, that they're the counting machine, uh, there's a barcode. And the barcode is for the, the ballot itself. And I, I'm sorry, I haven't seen it. So does the ballot also have a barcode on it? There's no, I, I think I get your question. The, the barcode is there as a safeguard. Uh, Delaware County, before my time, selected Heart Inner Civic, one of the reasons was it had a, a unique security feature in that no individual ballot could be scanned more than once, which protected against someone possibly photocopying a ballot, whether it was a vote by mail ballot or, or regular election day ballot or whatever, and submitting it more than once. Um, so the, the, the barcode does not ever connect to the voter. So there's no, there's no Otherwise, you would be sacrificing the secret ballot. So the then barcode is the just question. to... Okay, I, go I, ahead. I understand you. Yes, thank you. Um, so this scanning, well, there may be another name for it, but the scanning machine that counts it, when the um, ballot goes into it, is that barcode being read to say this is only once, once and only, or is it... Yes. Um, yes. Okay, that's what I need to know. And then there are, there are a few barcodes, but the other ones correspond to just the precinct and the, the ward and the... the, the you know, the okay, jurisdiction so it's not that it's just, from. So just to reiterate or restate, the flat ballot, when it gets to the scanning device, that it is, although it's reading just the vote, uh, it is also, uh, 
you're saying that the computer is acknowledging the uh, barcode and saying that it's a one and done. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. If somebody were to make a mistake and try to send that stack of ballots back through, the scanner would say, uh-uh. It catches it. Thank you. Larry Wiegand again. And, and I would reiterate what's been said to, to most of you. I, I genuinely appreciate all of your work. I know it is a monumental task. <laughs> I am not pointing fingers at Mr. Allen or Mr. Savage. I, I, my daughter worked for you for a few months, so I know what the monumental task is. I've been at the election polls since 06. Um, just there are certain things that go on when it comes to this devil we have of the mail-in ballot that continually gets suspect. And I am not pointing at something to say it is nefarious. It's been conspiracy theoried for ever and a day since its inception that there is this steal. What solves that issue is the transparency. Transparency of the board, transparency of the process. I interviewed all of the poll watchers that I brought in for the mail-in ballot, okay? And I will tell you almost unanimously amongst the bunch they don't feel that they are close enough to the process. And I get we have some COVID restrictions and we have some logistical restrictions, but when they are involved in those processes, they need to be close enough to be able to observe. I don't remove a poll watcher that wants to come into my polling place to observe the machine, to observe the books. We need to extend that same to this new wrinkle of mail-in. You know, there, there are blind spots, and perhaps maybe that's something for the board to consider, is to have someone come in to the new Wharf at Rivertown facility and have them evaluate the blind spots of the video system so that we can at least go to the public and say, zero blind spots, folks. I, I understand, Mr. Chairman, we don't do 65%, 80%. We want 100%. And that's why I'm standing here to say this to all of you. We want 100% because that perception of the public is that this is a convoluted process. I want to eliminate that for you because I want things to go forward in a different fashion. When we have the, these processes and the people are six, eight feet away and the individual that is supposed to answer questions, and I get we're short staffed, I understand, but when there's questions, they have to be able to be posed. And they don't want to have interaction with the individual people working there. Perhaps we need to task a specific person to liaison with the poll worker to make sure those questions get answered and get answered in a timely fashion because they're there to be these candidates' eyes and ears. They're there to be my eyes and ears to make sure that I can go back to all my supporters just like the winners of this uh, election at this point are gonna go back to their supporters and go, we won. Um, I wanna be able to go back to mine and, and go, we fell short. And I'll reiterate what Mr. Ruggieri said, I, I, I'm okay taking a loss, I was a fighter. Uh, you know, if, if I get a black eye, that's fine. I, I'm okay with that. But I gotta be able to go back and say, the entire process is entirely fair. And when I have almost a unanimous across the board with my watchers that, that, that gives that shadow of a doubt that we can't allow to stand. And, and that's what I say back to you. There, there are logistical things that we can fit people into a room and have them in a closer proximity so they can say, when you're reconciling a ballot or you know whatever term you're using for that, that the appropriate boxes were filled in. We, There's we, not something nefarious going on. You know, I, I, I want to be able to go back and say that to everyone, and so do all of you, for that matter. Yeah, I mean, I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll say this. To that point, we did sit up. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say two things. And Mr. Allen will have a lot more specifics. But, um, you know, we last year went through this circumstance where we were in court and reached an agreement in court and the, the court ordered that the watcher. So this year, it was even closer than what the court ordered. We added a second area. So we, you know, 
and we worked with the parties beforehand to try to get their input on that. Um, we can continue to work with them and, and try to get that done. To the extent, I, I, I haven't heard anybody say there's an issue with not enough cameras. I think we have 10 cameras, but you know, if we can add a couple more cameras, they don't cost a heck of a lot. I'm happy to look into that, because we, we do want it to be transparent, but Jim, perhaps you have some more specifics. Well, watchers have the ability to observe, and, but. Just but want to they, be clear. They, they, the term for these people watching this is called observers. Poll watchers watch at polls. This is not a polling place, and that's not a shot at anybody, but just so we're all on the same page and we're using the right language. These are observers. People show up at a watcher certificate and they want to observe. So, so, okay. so the observers. Thank you, Mr. Thank Solicitor, you. for. Thank you for the correction. <laughs> I, was, I was wrong. Um, so when the observers come, it's, it's not like the precinct polling place where uh, you have the ability to, you know, ask, you know, go through who all the voters were and everything like that, and, or, and they have to call out the name, and you can also go through the, the poll book and, and determine who's voted and who hasn't. Uh, but at the same time, you don't get to stand over the scanner, right? And that's kind of, when, we, when it gets down to the wharf, you can see all the reports about whose vote-by-mail ballots uh, have been received and who's being processed and everything like that. But, you, you know, at the same time, you, you, we're not going to walk you from seeing the Jones envelope, you know, opened to the, extra, the, the, the ballot, you know, removed, and then you're able to see the Jones ballot, you know, up, up close and personal. But we did set up a separate station for the, for the process of transcribing ballots. And we set up a separate station and we moved the V drive, since there were questions about the V drives in the past, we moved that to the very front of the room this year. Uh, so when I got here, it was in the, in the back, not mm -hmm. in the back room, but tore away from the public. So we are trying to move the, in that direction. That, that's all. I, I respect what you're saying. And if there's more we can do, we'll do it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Just so we can comment, um, I just want to follow up on what Mr. Wiegand said. Um, was brought to my attention today, and, and I appreciate everything everyone's doing and everything. Um, not that there was enough cameras, but on a one camera feed, the poll, the workers put the racks and obstructed what they were doing from the camera. Um, it was brought to my attention that somebody made a phone call and it was quickly adjusted, but stuff like that may go unnoticed for a long time. So in a sense of transparency, um, I just want to bring it to your attention that that did happen and was addressed, but. Who knows how long they were watching it, they were obstructed for. Yeah, I, so. I mean, I got to say, I'm in that room all the time. I don't even notice there's the cameras. There's seemingly so many of them. So I, I don't think anybody put racks in a particular place for any reason other than they, 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 they no, move the racks. We're happy. But yeah, but it, it can happen. I, I see that. Says they're doing on purpose, it's right. All right. Any other comments? All right, I think we're done. Uh, our next meeting is uh, Friday at uh, two. Are we in this room again? Or are we no, we're going to be in the council. We're back council in the room. council chambers Friday. Sorry, in, the, in the county council room at uh, 2 p.m. on Friday. With that, uh, we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's crazy to think you'd be done by 3.30. Oh, I thought we'd be done at 3 o'clock. I did too.